The next item of business is consideration of business motion 17902 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a timetable for stage three consideration of the management of offenders Scotland Bill. Uh, could I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no member, Mr Dorn, are you wishing to speak against this motion? No, that's fine. Uh, no member has... No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore the question is that motion 17902 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed, thank you. Now the next item is a consideration of the stage three proceedings on the management of offenders bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill as amended at stage two, the marshalled list and the groupings of amendments. And just to remind members, the division bell will sound uh, and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes following the first, or for the first division of the afternoon. There'll be a 30 second vote after that. Thereafter, there'll be a one minute uh, period for voting after the first division following a debate. Now, members who wish to speak in a debate should press their request to speak buttons as soon as I call uh, the group, or as soon as possible after that. So now we refer to the marshal's list. And I call group one. Part one, terminology. Now, before I call the Cabinet Secretary, could I point, point out that throughout this group, there are a number of amendments that, if agreed to, would preempt the other amendments in this group. In the interest of time, I do not propose to mention the preemptions on each occasion where they occur, but I would refer members to the groupings where, uh, for preemption information. Can I call Amendment 4 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendments as shown, Cabinet Secretary, to move Amendment 4 and speak to all the amendments in this group? Thank you very much, Planning Officer. I move Amendment 4 in my name. At Stage 2, I supported Daniel Johnson's amendments, which removed the term offender from Part 1. The Government listened to the concerns expressed and supported the changes so that no one would feel stigmatised by the language of the legislation. At uh, stage two, when I signalled that I supported the principle behind Daniel Johnson's amendments, I indicated that the government would need time to reflect on the technical impact on the drafting and may need to revisit the terminology for readability and workability. As things stand, the label relevant person does not work because it's undefined. Reflecting on how to address that problem in a way that would be consistent with the committee's view at stage two, we realise that, in fact, there is no need for the bill to apply labels to people subject to electronic monitoring at all. Uh, we needn't call them relevant persons. They are simply persons who happen to be subject to a monitoring requirement. The amendments in my name, therefore, get rid of the labels altogether, with only a few exceptions where the label monitored person is used to distinguish the person subject to a monitoring requirement from the person who is designated to carry out the monitoring. Amendment 145 is a clarificatory amendment to put beyond doubt that references to disposals in part one are not confined to the final disposals in a case. I invite members to support the amendments in my name in this group, and I invite members to reject the amendments from Liam Kerr, which would reinstate the word offender, directly contradicting the decision of the Justice Committee at stage two. To be clear, using the label offender does nothing to improve the bill's technical precision and has no other legal effect. And as I say, I move amendment four in my name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'm going to call Liam Kerr to move Amendment 4E and to speak to the other amendments in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. All my amendments in this group seek to reverse Daniel Johnson's terminology amendments at Stage 2. Parliament cannot fail to have seen the considerable public outcry when this was passed at Stage 2, and I think it's important that the full chamber has an opportunity to reflect on the committee's decision. This is the Management of Offenders Bill. Its purpose is to deal with people who have offended committed a crime. Laws mean something and they should be clear. If we are referring to offenders, we should call them offenders. Parliament will be interested to know that the key argument presented in committee was that it doesn't help rehabilitation to label people as offenders after they have served their time. I understand that point, but most of these provisions deal with criminals before they have completed their sentence. This bill talks about how we manage those who are in the system not so much those who have completed it. And finally, I, I won't, Mr. McCarthy, because I presume you'll be speaking later, and I just want to move it on. Uh, finally, there, there's no doubt that many victims of crime already feel that more is being done to support offenders than those who have suffered. We cannot 
and should not airbrush from history that a crime, an offence, has been committed. And for these reasons, President Officer, I ask Parliament to recognise that an offender is an offender and vote in favour of my amendments. Thank you very much, Mr Kerr. I call Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And given that it was my amendments at stage two that created this, I feel something of a responsibility to uh, speak up for myself at this stage. However, I will be very brief, and indeed, I'm going to try and limit myself to something of a self-imposed 60-second rule throughout this stage three amendment debate. Labels don't help, as the Cabinet Secretary said. Good legislation should have well-defined uh, terminology and shouldn't need to refer to people by anything other than the term people. And for that reason, I think we should support the government's amendments and reject the Conservative ones. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very popular comment from Mr Johnson. I call Lee MacArthur to be followed by John Finney. Lee MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I wasn't even intending on observing the 60-second rule. I wasn't intending um, speaking until um, Liam Kerr's uh, invitation to do so. I think the point the Cabinet Secretary and Daniel Johnson have made in relation to um, the stigmatisation is, uh, is absolutely fair and valid, and um, I, I think uh, it reinforces what we heard through the evidence session uh, throughout our consideration of this bill. I think the other important fact is that uh, in extending uh, these provisions to those um, uh, pre any ruling from, uh, from the court would become impossible were it not for the, the redefinition uh, as proposed by the Cabinet Secretary. So we'll certainly be supporting those amendments. Thank you. And John Finney. Thank you. Uh, I endorse the comments of the Cabinet Secretary and uh, my colleagues um, Daniel Johnston and Liam MacArthur. Airbrushing, I think, is a pejorative term. I think it's meant to be a pejorative term and uh, most certainly will not be supporting Liam Kerr's position. And can I call the uh, Cabinet Secretary to wind up on Amendment 4? I call Liam Kerr to wind up in a minute for you. Cabinet Secretary. Nothing much to add other than to thank colleagues uh, for, for, for the contributions. What I would say to, to Liam Kerr, something I've said since taking on this role uh, a year ago, is that we should always be driven by, by, by that, the, the data and the experts that are in front of us. And he has a lot of respect, I know, for organisations like the Wise Group uh, and many others that work with those who have uh, committed uh, crimes in the past. And they will tell you that language is important. Now, this, this change in the, 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 the legislation will not... Uh, for example, make it illegal for anybody or criminalise anybody for using the word offender. They can use that in their daily discourse uh, if they wish to do so. But as legislators, we have responsibility to listen to those experts and, as I say, uh, change the law accordingly. I'm delighted to have the support of the majority, it seems, uh, of parliamentarians to do that. Thank you. And I call Liam Kerr to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 4A. Uh, like the Cabinet Secretary, I don't have a great deal to add other than to say that language is important. I do accept that point and that's why we must call it as it is. Uh, so for that reason, I move, I press for a. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Kerr. Now the question is that amendment 4A, yes. amendment 4A be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Now this is the first division of the afternoon, so we're going to suspend for five minutes while I summon members to the chamber. So it'll be a short suspension of five minutes.
Thank you, colleagues. Parliament is now resumed, and uh, we're going to go straight to the question. So the question is that Amendment 4A be agreed to, and members may cast their votes now on Amendment 4A. This is the 30-second vote. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 4A in the name of Liam Kerr is yes, 26, no, 84. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call, uh, ask Liam Kerr to move Amendment 4B? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 4B be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. Again, a 30-second division. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 4B in the name of Liam Kerr is yes, 27, no, 85. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Now, the next question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to, but Amendment 4 will preempt. Ah, yes, yeah. Uh, amendment 4 will preempt Amendments 5 and 6. Now, does the Cabinet Secretary wish to press or withdraw Amendment 4? That moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 4 in the name of Hamza Youssef is yes, 85, no, 27. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore agreed. Now, be before I move on to the next amendment, which will be 7, um, can I just confirm with Mr Kerr that he, he, there's, a, there's a huge number of um, amendments which preempt other amendments. Can I just confirm with Mr. Kerr whether or not he wishes to move uh, amendments, in this case, 8, 10, 12, and 14? Uh, <coughs> Presiding officer, with your permission, I'll uh, speak in response rather than just say yes or no. Uh, look, these amendments seek to make the same changes as at amendments 4A and 4B. I maintain this is the right thing to do for certainty and semantics. However, it is clear to me that only the Scottish Conservatives are with me on that. There are extremely important debates to have this afternoon and to ensure time. I note that my comments to 4A and 4B are on the record and I will not be pressing my further amendments in this group uh, and any similar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Kerr. I would just, I would just highlight at this stage that any other member in this chamber is entitled to move any of these amendments at the point at which they are reached. Now, to ensure that's allowed to happen, I would normally call each in turn. But in the exceptional circumstances of this case, where we have a very large number of amendments all directed at the same issue, I propose to try to speed up the process um, <laughs> slightly. Um, amendments about this particular subject appear in five blocks 
and I will take the same approach for each block of amendments. So in this case, can I ask if any other member wishes to move any of the amendments 8, 10, 12 or 14? No. <laughs> Thank you very much. As no one indicates that they wish to move, uh, and as all the amendments do the same thing, I propose to invite the Cabinet Secretary now to move amendments 7, 9, 11 and 13 on block. Moved on block. Thank you very much. Now, this is a separate question. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 7, 9, 11 and 13? No. Okay. In that, question, the que in that case, the question is that amendments 7, 9, 11 and 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group 2, Availability of Information to Social Work when Court Disposing of a Case. Can I call Amendment 144 in the name of Liam Kerr in a group of its own and Liam Kerr to move and to speak to the amendment? Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm resubmitting this amendment for Parliament to consider its position. The principle of the amendment founds upon that during Stage 1 evidence, Social Work Scotland told us that, quote, on the information and evidence that criminal justice social work receives to inform our risk and needs assessment, what is sorely lacking is the summaries of evidence that are narrated in court. Without it, we are entirely reliant on the offender's version of events. So we know that summaries of court evidence are critical to an objective and accurate risk assessment. And without it, social workers will have less information than they should about how decisions may affect victims. My concern on this, President Officer, is that victims and the public are unnecessarily put at risk because the right information isn't being shared. Now, as I say, I brought this forward at stage two and committee members had several concerns. John Finney asked about what status a summary would have. And the answer, I think, is it would only have the weight that the social workers preparing their risk and needs assessment attributed to it. The definitive document remains the risk and needs assessment prepared by criminal justice social work. I'll take an intervention. Yeah. John Finney. Grateful for the member taking the intervention. The member uh, perhaps is coming on to explain the analysis he's done of the impact this might have on the court services on the already pressed criminal justice social work services. Liam Kerr. Yeah, it's a reasonable point. I'm grateful for the intervention because in stage two, several members did raise the concern that the court system wouldn't have the resources to prepare the summary. And I do understand that, John Finney. Uh, but surely, if something is the right thing to do, it is up to the government to assess what resources the courts uh, will need, especially for such a crucial bit of communication between the courts and criminal justice social work. Now, the Cabinet Secretary said in committee that there is no mechanism across all court business for routine, routinely collecting and transmitting such evidence. Well, surely that is the problem. And that is what my amendment seeks to address. It would be up to the court to decide what form the summary took, and I'm sure that they could create a format that works best for them. So, presiding officer, my amendment seeks to ensure that social workers have as much evidence as practicable in front of them before making crucial risk assessments, which will inform judges' decisions as to whether an offender is safe to be on our streets. I believe I've answered the challenges, and I seek Parliament's approval to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Kerr. Can I call Daniel Johnson? Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise just very briefly in support of this. There is one recurring theme that the committee heard throughout its evidence taking and indeed in other issues it's heard on in the last year or so, which is the lack of information and data, especially from the courts and also to the courts. And I believe this amendment makes good provision for ensuring that that is improved. And for those reasons, um, I think uh, they are, they, it merits support. Thank you. Thank you. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak? Thank you, President Officer. This amendment uh, 144 in exactly this form was defeated at stage two, so I'm surprised uh, to see that it's been lodged again at stage three. Uh, the amendment, as Liam Kerr has explained, seeks to place a new obligation on the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service that they make a summary of evidence provided in a case available to local authorities existing in their social work function. Uh, when we discussed this previously at committee, Mr Kerr was asked by Mr Finney about the practicalities of this who would produce the summary and what would its status be. Um, we did not get answers to those questions and I'm not convinced we've got them from Mr Kerr's uh, remarks. He was also pressed by Fulton McGregor, I thought, quite forensically as to whether or not Liam Kerr had had any discussions with Social Work Scotland, social workers or indeed the relevant agencies about the amendment. The, answers we were, the answer we were given by Mr Kerr was a categorical no, he has not. So I'd be interested in whether or not Liam Kerr has had discussions with Social Work Scotland or indeed the relevant agencies I'm happy to give way if he has. It is crucial in, if seeking to improve the process of risk assessment that were led by the considerations 
of the Risk Management Authority as to what information is most relevant to risk. Accordingly, we need to be cautious as parliamentarians that we do not seek to preempt those considerations and predetermine the information which is to be considered as having a bearing on risk. Uh, this amendment would extend across all forms of court-imposed electronic monitoring. A social work report is prepared for the court when considering the imposition of an RLO, a restriction of liberty order. So social work will be aware of the background to these cases anyway. There seems limited merit, therefore, in requiring the court to provide information to a local authority which they're already likely to have or be aware of. In addition, social work involvement in monitoring an individual serving a community sentence will vary depending on the particular community sentence imposed. For example, there's no requirement for a supervising officer to be appointed by a local authority for an individual sentence to an RLO. The provision of a summary of the evidence in those circumstances would obviously clearly be a pointless exercise. Uh, in practical terms, I would also note that it's not clear how the court would be able to identify which local authority is uh, the relevant authority at the time of sentencing. And I draw Mr Kerr's attention to Amendment 126 in my name, which would create a duty to cooperate between, amongst others, the Scottish, uh, Scottish ministers, the Scottish courts and tribunal service. This duty to cooperate would include the sharing of information. Uh, this duty to cooperate would address the concerns Mr Kerr has about the sharing of information but would rightly retain the flexibility for the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to determine what information they can usefully and practically provide. Uh, Amendment 144 presents the same challenges as when it was discussed at Stage 2. I'd ask Liam Kerr not to press this amendment, and if pressed, I would urge members uh, to reject it. Thank you. And I call on Liam Kerr to wind up and to press or withdraw this amendment. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to the members uh, who have spoken. I'm grateful to Daniel Johnson for his support on this. And uh, Cabinet Secretary, what I would say is this was, is the exact form. Well, yes, it is, because it was right at stage two, and it's still right at stage three. You say you didn't get the answers, or the Cabinet Secretary says he didn't get the answers, but I'm not the government. I'm not in a position. I'm able to put the principle forward, and the Cabinet Secretary said that we would discuss this before stage three. That has not taken place, Cabinet Secretary. So... I'm a little bit coming from behind where the Cabinet Secretary could have helped me on this. Um, listen, the point about... Uh, I won't, actually, if, if it's all right, Cabinet Secretary, because it's not, it's not a major point. The, the point about discussions with Social Work Scotland uh, that, that was made in Stage 2, I, I quoted from Social Work Scotland. That was what the committee heard. What is sorely lacking is the summaries of evidence narrated in court. There may be important information missing from that, particularly in relation to victims. And I also draw the Cabinet Secretary's attention to Recommendation 182 of the Justice Committee's Stage 1 report, in which the committee called on the Scottish Government to explore with the SCTS how to routinely supply criminal justice social workers with summaries of evidence. So the Cabinet Secretary says there's, there's limited merit, but the Justice Committee was clear on the merits. Uh, and uh, to my mind, that is why this Parliament must take that forward. Uh, just before I move it, presiding officer, the Cabinet Secretary alludes to Amendment 126. And just for the avoidance of doubt, Cabinet Secretary, I think it is a good amendment and we'll be voting for it shortly. Uh, but I don't think that negates why we should vote for Amendment 144, which I hereby move in my name. Thank you. And the question, therefore, is that Amendment 144 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <gasps> We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast the votes now. This will be a one-minute division.
The result of the vote on amendment number 144 in the name of Liam Kerr is yes, 44, no, 69. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I ask the Cabinet Minister to move amendment 15? Already debated. Moved. Thank you. Uh, and amendment 15, if agreed, will preempt amendment 16. The question is that amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now, at this point, could I again ask Liam Kerr just to confirm uh, that he doesn't wish to move amendments 17, 20, 22, 24, 25, 27, 29, 31, 33, 36, 38, 40, 42, 44, 46, 48, 50, 51, 54, 56, 59, 57 and 59. Not moved. Not moved. And I'm going to ask if any other member wishes to move any of these amendments. No. no. Uh, in that case, we we'll move on. And I propose to invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 18, 19, 21, 23, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 145, 37, 39, 41, 43, 45, 47, 49, 52, 53, 55, 58 and 60 on block. Moved on block. Thank you very much. Now, does any member object if I put the question on all these amendments on block? No. Good. So the question is, that amendments 18, 19, 21, 23, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 145, 37, 39, 41, 43, 45, 47, 49, 52, 53, 55, 58 and 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. Now, turning to Group 3, Public, Public Authorities' Duties to Cooperate and Prepare in Relation to Prisoners' Release, can I call Amendment 61 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with the other amendments in this grouping, and the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 61? Uh, thank you, President Officer. I move Amendment 61 uh, in my name. While we support the principle behind the original amendment at Stage 2 on information sharing from Daniel Johnson, we oppose this at Stage 2 on the grounds that it was unnecessary and created some practical challenges. The amendment was voted through and now forms Section 7A of the Bill. The concerns we raised about this amendment remain valid. Uh, amendment 61 seeks to remove 7A from the Bill and Amendment 126 proposes an alternative approach to information sharing. The obligation in Section 7A is on Scottish ministers to request information relevant to the monitoring of that prisoner from specified bodies. The specified bodies are Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, Police Scotland and a relevant local authority. The specified bodies must provide the information requested within 28 days of the request. The practical issues with the amendment uh, that was passed are as follows. The duty to request information arises before the prisoner is released on HDC but the duty is caveated that it need only be complied with where reasonably practicable. Uh, the Scottish ministers could therefore release a prisoner on HDC without complying with the duty if they can show that it was not reasonably practicable to do so. The Scottish uh, ministers are obliged to request information prior to releasing a prisoner on HDC, but they are under no obligation to wait for the information being provided before releasing the prisoner. There is no description of what information relevant to monitoring may mean. The Scottish ministers would therefore have a wide power to request any information linked to monitoring of prisoners on HDC. Uh, furthermore, there's no ability on the part of a specified body to refuse the request, either in part or in whole. Uh, and also, there's no definition of what a relevant local authority may be or how the Scottish ministers are to, are to determine which local authority is relevant to the prisoner. As we noted at stage two, information is already shared between Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, Police Scotland, local authorities and SPS, and the information is used by the Scottish Prison Service in determining applications for HDC. Therefore, our starting position was that this is unnecessary. However, this section may also disrupt current arrangements. Uh, creating a requirement to request information in every case could place an unnecessary burden on SPS, as they may already have the necessary information or they may not require further information. The timing of the request could also interrupt the determination of HDC. If a request is made 
and the time frame set out in legislation now only allow, now allows 28 days for it to be provided, that could slow down the determination of HDC and lead to available periods for HDC being shortened. As we are sympathetic to the intent behind Section 7A, Amendment 126 would replace Section 7A with measures setting out a related but alternative approach. There's a duty in Section 1 of the Management of Offenders uh, Scotland Act 2005 on Scottish ministers and local authorities to cooperate with each other in carrying out respective functions in relation to two specific groups uh, of individuals. Those who are supervised, advised, guided or assisted by a local authority as part of a service provided under sections 27.1, 27.1a, uh, 27ZA of the 2005 Act. Uh, that, this includes uh, those released from prison on licence and those supervised under community sentence and also those who are detained in custody. This duty to cooperate expressly includes the sharing of information. Uh, I believe that Amendment 126 retains the original intent behind Section 7A but avoids the difficulties with that section that I have described. Uh, as regards Amendment 2 lodged by Daniel Johnson, Access to suitable accommodation is important in supporting individuals leaving prison to successfully reintegrate and reducing the risk of reoffending. However, I do not believe that this amendment is a proportionate or effective means of achieving the same. I believe it risks losing the current flexibility that allows support to be tailored to the needs of the individual. The Scottish Government already supports a range of interventions that support prisoners leave, prison, prison leavers to reintegrate into their community. This includes measures to support uh, them to access accommodation on liberation, for example, the shore standards that set out good practice of how the SPS and local government housing authorities will ensure that housing needs of individuals in prison are met. It's important to note that local authorities already have statutory duties to address the needs of individuals presenting as homeless and to provide them information, support and services of in, uh, to individuals that are at risk of homelessness. So I'm not persuaded, therefore, that there's a need to legislate and require Scottish ministers to take separate action to achieve the same aim. Uh, duplicating existing duties and activities would be inefficient, it would be disruptive, create confusion regarding responsibility for housing individuals leaving prison. Uh, instead, we should focus on making existing processes as effective as possible. The Scottish Government will be looking at wider legislation and statutory guidance to ensure that everyone facing homelessness is able to exercise their right and gain access to appropriate support. This work cannot take place in the context of the justice system alone, uh, and this bill is not the right place to make such substantial changes to housing provision. I therefore ask Mr Johnson not to press Amendment 2, and if he presses, I ask Parliament to reject it. In terms of Amendment 128, uh, I welcome Daniel Johnson's effort to encourage us to think about how the justice system could operate differently. His Amendment 128 seeks to add a new element to HDC, requiring that Scottish ministers take steps to ensure that a person subject to a curfew condition is provided with meaningful activity while subject to the curfew condition. I'm not convinced that legislation is required in this area in order to support people in HDC. Home detention curfew provides an opportunity to support effective reintegration by enabling part of a prisoner sentence to be served in the community subject to license conditions and electronic monitoring. This option can currently be provided alongside other services available to support individuals leaving short-term sentences, including pre-release planning, voluntary social work through care, the SPS's through care support service and third sector offender mentoring services. Although well-intentioned, I believe Daniel Johnson's amendment could create significant restrictions on the way the HDC system operates. The definition of meaningful activity is to be prescribed by the Scottish ministers via subordinate legislation, but must include work of volunteering. However, not every individual on HDC would be able to, or indeed willing to engage with those working or volunteering opportunities. It's not clear whether those individuals would be restricted from accessing HDC as there could be no meaningful activity provided for them. Ministers do not control the employment market, so could not ensure that work is available for everyone in HDC. This would be a duty that Scottish ministers could never comply with. In any event, the ministers prescribing uh, work or volunteering opportunities for people cut across other work or family commitments they may have. This system does not take account of the need for flexibility to take account of the specific circumstances of the individual. Ultimately, I do agree there's more that we can do to try and help ensure that those who are released from prison are able to connect with public services and are given opportunities. However, I disagree with an approach that seeks to set a broad and mandatory set of activity rather than allowing these to be determined on a voluntary basis. For those reasons, I would propose to resist this uh, amendment and I move, uh, I move Amendment 61 in my name. 
Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I call Daniel Johnson to speak to Amendment 2 and the other amendments in this group? Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I speak to Amendment 2 and 128, uh, but before I do, I'd like to address the, the comments made by the Cabinet Secretary regarding Amendments uh, uh, 61 and 126. Um, it's with some regret um, that I see that the Government have tabled Amendment 61 because I, I do believe that one of the clear uh, recommendations from HMICS and HMIPS was the need to improve information sharing between agencies. That was one of the critical issues that was found by those agencies regarding the tragic death of Craig McClelland. And while I do recognise that uh, uh, Amendment 126 puts in an alternative, I do not believe that it's as robust as a legal requirement to, to share information, which I think would be much more robust. However, if uh, Amendment 61 is passed, um, I, 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 I do believe that people should support Amendment 126. Um, with regard to Amendments 2 and 128, I mean, I believe that fundamentally what the justice system should aim towards in terms of its duty to protect the public, the best way that it can do that is by promoting reform and preventing reoffending. And put simply, all too often uh, as uh, the system currently stands, we simply return people to the very circumstances which they found themselves and led to their offending in the first place. What these two amendments seek to do is to change that. And indeed, the other amendments I put forward in, in, at stage two regarding access to a GP and address and other measures, again, sought to rectify that situation. And while I understand that it may be difficult and it may be costly, Nonetheless, these things are vital because they are not happening. And while, yes, there may well be standards in place, I don't believe that that legal duty is one that currently exists. The shore standards are, are, do not have a, a, a statutory footing. And indeed, Wales has legislated on such a duty. And so if, I would simply ask the question, if it's good enough for Wales, why isn't it good enough for Scotland? And as for meaningful activity, I fundamentally believe the best way we prevent reoffending is by finding people meaningful work. And yes, that may be difficult. And no, the Scottish Government does not control the, the employment market. But it's certainly, surely, if people are being released from prison, albeit on HDC, something for them to do must be found if we are going to make sure that they do not re-offend. So for those reasons, I will be pressing Amendments 2 and, and, and uh, 128. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And can I call Graeme Simpson to be followed by John Finney? <coughs> Thanks, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm speaking just now um, in my capacity as convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Um, so I'm not going to make any comment on the policy implications of Section 7A or the Cabinet Secretary's Amendment 61 to remove it from the bill. The committee met this morning to scrutinise the recently lodged Supplementary Delegated Powers Memorandum. Now, unfortunately, this breached the timescale required by standing orders and meant that our only chance to consider it was this morning. The committee was disappointed with this lack of time to effectively scrutinise the changes stemming from stage two and we were clearly limited in what we were able to recommend to the Parliament. The committee does however acknowledge the past few months have been a busy legislative period for all of us. We appreciate that oversights do happen but this should not have happened, presiding officer. However, our report is now published. We make a number of recommendations on the supplementary delegated powers. One of those was in relation to section 7A and the committee agreed that I should highlight these concerns uh, just now, given that members will not have had a chance to read the report. The committee noted that the delegated power in section 7A is particularly wide in its scope, which contrasts with powers in other sections of the bill. The committee also observed that the obligation to request information relevant to the monitoring of the prisoner concerned is potentially very wide ranging. There will be data protection implications involved in sharing such information about the prisoner. The committee therefore considered that the affirmative rather than negative procedure would have been more appropriate for a power of this nature. This may, of course, be a moot point, presiding officer, if Section 7A is removed this, today, but I commend the committee's report to the Chamber. 
Thank you very much. And I call John Finney to be followed by Liam Kerr. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I was very content with the provisions that were put in by Section uh, 7A at Stage 2, so we won't be supporting the Cabinet Secretary's uh, Amendment 61 to remove it. Um, sadly, I'll not be supporting um, my colleague uh, Daniel Johnson's um, Amendment 128 either. Entirely well-meaning, I just think that there are a number of challenges connected with it and uh, it, I should in any case say it should be part of a, a robust discharge plan for want of a better term but I think for many of the reasons the cabinet secretary outlined um, uh, there are practical issues around that however uh, we'll be supporting Daniel Johnson's amendment too because <clears throat> the cabinet secretary talked about statutory duties and good practice indeed he, he, he promised us wider legislation and statutory guidance but everything we've heard cabinet secretary you'll know is about the challenge placed in people discharged because of accommodation. And uh, it remains an issue. I think this amendment uh, too goes some way to addressing that. And if it provides focus, then perhaps that's the focus that the Cabinet Secretary is seeing that will arrive with the wider lesson, legislation, if I noted them correctly, or the statutory guidelines is intended. It isn't working at the moment. We need to have more robust provision of accommodation. So we will be supporting Daniel Johnson's amendment too. Thank you very much. And I call Liam Caird to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll just rise very briefly to speak in support of Daniel Johnson's Amendments 2 and 128. One of the points of this legislation, it seems to me, is to help rehabilitation. And I've listened to Daniel Johnson and John Finney's comments just there, and I think these measures would and therefore surely have merit. Uh, thus, we will be supporting Amendments 2 and 128 in Daniel Johnson's name. Thank you very much. And I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I, uh, I think share Daniel Johnson's um, curiosity as to why the government have sought to remove uh, amendment, uh, Section 7A, uh, not least because, as I recall, it was uh, supported unanimously by the committee uh, at stage two. So I think um, had the government uh, been so concerned at what the committee unanimously agreed at stage two, there would have been some engagement between stage two and stage three. Uh, I think, like John Finney, um, Daniel Johnson, in, in relation to his amendments two and one, two, eight, makes uh, some very valid points about uh, the key role that um, uh, gainful activity and indeed housing play in the process of rehabilitation and reintegration. I think the concern I have, and I had it at stage two, is that framed in the way that, that this is, the implications where that is not in place is that the individual remains in prison and that cannot be in the best interest of that individual either. So it's with regret while accepting uh, the principle underlying the, the, those amendments uh, that we will not be able to support them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole. Fulton McGregor. Uh, thanks, President Officer. I, I want to lend my support to the Cabinet Secretary's amendments at 61 and 126, but I want to, to speak briefly against Daniel Johnson's amendments at 2 and 128. Again, like uh, Liam MacArthur, I, I think there's positive intentions behind them, but they're, they're in the wrong place, uh, in my opinion, as put forward um, as part of the bill. There's a lot of work already going on in this area. We, we, we heard that a lot during committee. Uh, there's some good work uh, around housing and employment, and as Daniel Johnson brought forward at stage two around health. And I think that these uh, are issues that are best left to local service providers who are doing the job every day and not in the, the hands of MSPs and, and politicians here. I think that we need to, to move away from centralising that. And if there's... I, I was just finishing up, but certainly. John Finney. Thank you. I'm grateful for the member taking intervention on that point. Who would be the local service provider if someone comes from location A, they were arrested from location B and they plan to relocate to... Uh, location C. Who's the housing provider there? The statutory obligation rests with the local authority. Which local authority, please? Well, 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 understanding in that hypothetical situation to, uh, to the member is the local authority where the member, um, or, uh, where the, the, the person originally came from, unless maybe arrangements have been made while they've been in, um, while they've been in custody to move somewhere else. But, but that's, that's, that's exactly the point. These arrangements have been made every day and it, there's, there, there's services that, that are in place to do that. I think that, as I said earlier, I think the intentions uh, behind the amendments are positive. In fact, I know that they are. I've spoke to Dan Daniel Johnson um, about them uh, on committee, and I think that they are, they, are, um, they, they are based on a positive intention, but I don't think this is the right place, and I don't think that we should be centralising uh, in, in this fashion, uh, and I'll certainly not be supporting these amendments. Thank you very much. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary to wind up in this group and to uh, press amendment or withdraw amendment 61. I'll press uh, amendment 61. Um, I, I've, uh, I've heard... What the committee has to say, but I, I, again, I, I think that legislation in the face of the bill 
uh, is the wrong place uh, for this amendment, although in principle I completely understand why Daniel Johnson ha has brought it forward, but uh, I'm hoping that our amendment uh, is, is seen as an improvement uh, to what was already passed uh, at committee. Uh, can I say to Graham Simpson, who is speaking on behalf uh, of, of the committee, I'm pleased to see that Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee welcomes uh, the fact that the bill was amended at stage two to apply the affirmative procedure to regulations um, made under section 9.1 in accordance with the committee's recommendation. Also pleased to note the committee reports that it's content with the delegated power provision as set out in relation to excluded sentences and approved devices. But of course, uh, he's absolutely right to, to put on record uh, the lack of time that the committee had. Therefore, uh, let me um, give my apologies to the committee for the inadvertent, uh, inadvertent breach um, of, of standing orders and constraining the time that they had to consider um, the SDPM, uh, the Supplementary Delegated Powers Memorandum. Uh, this was delayed as a result uh, of an administrative oversight, but I am very happy to put on record uh, my apologies to the committee uh, for that uh, lack of, of time. Thank you very much. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 61 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We're going to move to division. This will be a one-minute division on Amendment 61. Members, we've cast our votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 61 in the name of Hamza Youssef is yes, 58, no, 55. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Now at this point, uh, again, uh, may I ask Liam Kerr whether he wishes to move any of the amendments 62, 64, 67, 69, 70A, 71, 72A, 73, 76, 77A, 78, 80, 82, 83A, 84, 86, 88, 90, 91, A, 93, 95, 97, 99, 101 and 103. Not moved. Thank you very much. Would any other member wish to move any of these amendments? No. Thank you. In that case, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 63, 65, 66, 68, 70, 72, 74, 75, 77, 79, 81, 83, 85, 87, 89, 91, 92, 94, 96, 98, 100 and 102 on block. I moved on block. Thank you very much. Does any member object if I put the question on all these amendments on block? No. Thank you. So the question is that Parliament agrees amendments 63, 65, 66, 68, 70, 72, 74, 75, 77, 79, 81, 83, 85, 87, 89, 91, 92, 94, 96, 98, 100 and 102. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. We're going to turn now to Group 4. Persons subject to Part 1 monitoring, consequences of breach or deemed breach of disposal or condition. Can I call... Amendment 104 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with the other amendments, and Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 104. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I move Amendment 104 in my name. Amendment 104 removes the power of arrest in Section 12.3a, uh, which was voted in at Stage 2. This enables a constable to arrest an individual where they have reasonable grounds to suspect that the individual has contravened the requirement to wear and refrain from damaging the electronic tag. The implication being that this arrest may be effected without a warrant. The police already have powers to arrest an individual suspected of having committed an offence, but a breach of the electronic monitoring requirements either by an individual serving a community sentence 
or subject to licence conditions is not an offence in itself. This power of arrest would not therefore apply when an individual cuts off their tag. The unlawfully at large offence we created at stage two would of course enable the police to arrest an individual where they cut off their tag and fail to return to custody following recall. Those who are unlawfully at large can be arrested without warrant. It is not clear from the powers of arrest in section 12, uh, subsection 3A, what a constable is to do with an individual who is suspected of having breached an electronic monitoring requirement. An individual on licence is only liable to be returned to prison if the licence is revoked. Therefore, a constable arresting an individual only on suspicion that they may have breached their licence could not return that individual to prison. Uh, an individual serving a community sentence is only liable to be brought before the court if the breach procedures for that community sentence have been invoked. A constable arresting an individual only on suspicion that they have breached their community sentence could not return that individual to prison or take them to court. Uh, there are existing powers for the police, uh, the Scottish ministers and the courts to deal with an individual where they breach the terms of their licence or the community sentence. Those on licence can be recalled to prison and those serving a community sentence can be fined or sentenced afresh, even to, of course, imprisonment. A further point to note is that Mr Kerr's amendment also uses the word uh, offender, which the Justice Committee at stage two took to great pains to ensure was omitted from the legislation, and which we have confirmed in previous amendments at this stage. It is clear that the power of arrest in section 12.3a is unnecessary, and the creation of a specific statutory power of arrest is a departure from the use of a general power of arrest where an offence has been committed, agreed by the Parliament in 2016. Police Scotland have also expressed their concerns to us about the limitations and how this power could be used. The creation of a power to arrest an individual without a warrant in the absence of a criminal offence being suspected or committed and without a duty on the individual to return to prison would be confusing and could even represent potentially a breach of ECHR Article 5. Turning to Amendments 105 and 130, which would both create an offence of cutting off a tag, I would urge members to reject Amendment 105 for the following reasons. Uh, firstly, a near identical form of this amendment was rejected at stage two, and my arguments against that, against that amendment continue to apply here. Indeed, the only change to that earlier amendment is the provision of a limited form of statutory defence. Uh, secondly, the new unlawfully at large offence ensures that those who cut off their tag and abscond will be committing an offence, making one specific part of the same course of behaviour a further offence uh, is not therefore necessary. Uh, thirdly, the cutting off of the tag offence carries a maximum sentence of 12 months imprisonment. There would be a presumption against imprisonment for this new offence. Under this proposal, the individual may therefore be more likely to receive a fine. Uh, fourthly, there are, are already sanctions for those who cut off an electronic tag or otherwise breach the conditions of a licence or community sentence. The individual could be recalled to prison or indeed returned to court to face further punishment for the breach. Um, fifthly, the creation of the cutting off of a tag offence could lead to an individual serving a community sentence, being fined for the breach of the community sentence and being fined for cutting off the tag, enabling therefore two separate financial punishments to be imposed on the individual for the same course of conduct. Um, in contrast, the unlawfully at large offence wouldn't apply to community sentences, thereby avoiding the risk of double punishment. Uh, the defence provided in Amendment 105 would not protect an individual whose tag is damaged accidentally or removed forcefully by a third party. A defence of reasonable excuse would, not, uh, would be required to ensure that an individual was not convicted of an offence for conduct for which they had no control. Uh, the proposed defence would elevate the electronic monitoring requirement above all other conditions in the licence or community sentence even if those other conditions were more important in protecting the public. For example, an individual staying in their house and cutting off the tag would be committing an offence. But an individual breaching a condition not to go near a primary school would not be committing an offence. Uh, Amendment 130 in the name of Daniel Johnson is very similar in nature to Amendment 105, so the arguments against them also apply here. Uh, while the defence proposed in Daniel Johnson's amendment is framed differently, it still faces the same criticism as the defence provided in Amendment 105, an individual who accidentally damages their tag or an individual whose tag is forcefully removed against their will would not be afforded a defence under this amendment. Uh, one additional difficulty with Amendment 130 is there's no specific punishment for the offence. 
whereas Amendment 105 specifies the maximum punishment on summary conviction for the cutting off of a tag, there's no punishment specified at all in Amendment 130. It's not clear whether the offence created by Amendment 105 could be tried only summarily, uh, summarily, I should say, or if it could be tried in solemn proceedings uh, as well. I would urge members to vote to reject these two uh, amendments. In terms of Amendment 146, it's broadly similar to the amendment Margaret Mitchell tabled, which was rejected at stage two, and the reasons for rejecting remain the same. Uh, the only change is the addition uh, of language which qualifies that the designated person must notify a suspected breach to, quote, such bodies mentioned in subsection three as they consider appropriate. Amendment 146 would place an obligation on the designated person, which would currently be uh, G4S, to report every suspected breach of a community sentence or license condition to the police, as there are currently no other bodies specified in subsection three. The breach would also require to be reported whether or not the designated person considers that breach should be addressed by the police, or indeed not. This duty to report a suspected breach would apply whether or not the individual requires to be recalled in prison in terms of a license, or whether or not any enforcement action is to be taken. For example, an individual who is five minutes late for their HTC curfew would require to be reported to the police, even though the police would not act on that information unless the individual has been recalled, which in most instances one would suspect they would not be. The drafting of this amendment means the section applies where the individual is suspected of having breached a Section 3 disposal or Section 7 licence condition. There is no reference to an electronic monitoring requirement here, so the section would capture any breach of a disposal or licence listed in Section 3 or 7, even where no electronic monitoring requirement is imposed. Uh, finally, the obligation to inform is also confusing as it specifies two separate timescales for compliance. Immediately after the suspicion arises, or as soon as pr reasonably practicable after the suspicion arises. Uh, for all these reasons, above, I would ask members to reject this amendment. Thank you very much. And can I call Liam Kerr to speak to Amendment 105 and the other amendments in this group? Thank you, Presiding Officer. Parliament will be well cited on this amendment and its reasons, and it's imperative, in my view, that Parliament has its say. Members will be aware that, as the bill stands, offenders who are out on a tag can cut off their tag and it not be considered a criminal offence. This I find extraordinary. There should be an immediate power of arrest, and this amendment would provide that. The reality of increased tagging is that someone would be in prison but for the tag that they are wearing. We must surely therefore treat the removal of a tag as seriously as had they breached the prison wall. Now, Parliament will be reassured in considering this amendment to note that Scottish Women's Aid made clear to the committee in their stage one evidence that a criminal offence for these sorts of breaches is needed in order for there to be a credible deterrent. Whilst Victim Support Scotland, Community Justice Scotland and Positive Prisons called for robust responses to breaches of monitoring conditions. Now again, committee members rightly raised objections at stage two, which Parliament would no doubt wish to hear answered. Fulton McGregor was uncomfortable that such an offence seemed punitive. I can only respond that of course it is punitive because the offender has done something akin to breaching the prison wall. The cabinet secretary was concerned that someone might need to remove a tag for medical reasons and would then be further criminalised. Now I wasn't convinced at stage two and I remain unconvinced that this would happen let alone that I don't foresee some kind of strict liability around this, but I do see the need for reassurance, which is why I've added a defence of removing the tag for medical reasons. Presiding officer, if this legislation is going to increase the numbers on tags, the appropriate protections must be in place, and that means making it a criminal offence to tamper with or damage a tag, and I seek Parliament's support for my amendment. For similar reasons, we will support Daniel Johnson's Amendment 130, if he chooses to press it, and we will oppose Amendment 104, which was a sensible amendment at stage two, because it aimed to ensure police have powers of arrest where an offender has cut their tag off. This was in response to evidence the committee heard from the police that there are legal grey areas re with regards to their powers to apprehend. This puts it in black and white on the face of the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I call Margaret Mitchell to speak to Amendment 146 and the other amendments? Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. Uh, police officers do not monitor or control the conditions attached to electronic monitor. 
monitoring. So when a breach of these conditions occurs, for example, entering excluded area or tampering or removing the tag, the police officer's response is a reactive one. This in turn has raised concerns from Women's Aid, Victim Support Scotland and Community Justice Scotland that the response time to react uh, to a breach is too long. Amendment 146 therefore seeks to ensure that when there is a suspected breach of disposal or conditions, the relevant bodies are contacted immediately as soon as possible. The relevant bodies are listed as the Police Service of Scotland and or such other bodies as the Scottish Minister may by regulation specify. This amendment is similar, as the Cabinet Secretary said, to the one I lodged at stage two, but it's been revised to take account of the concern the Cabinet Secretary raised at stage two about minor breaches being escalated to the police. Now the amendment provides for discretion and a proportionate response to any breach by stipulating that immediately or as soon as is reasonably practicable, after a suspected breach has occurred, a person designated under section 11.1 must notify such bodies mentioned above as they consider appropriate. As they consider appropriate. In other words, the amendment allows for the designated person to use their judgment as to whether they consider the breach is one which must be responded to immediately, for example, by Police Scotland. And given domestic abuse uh, would be covered by these um, possible conditions and a breach could result in a victim immediately being put in danger I hope the Cabinet Secretary will support this because, crucially, it removes the potential for minor breaches, for example, as a result of a technical error um, to be escalated to the police, but does provide added protection for victims of domestic abuse. And finally, presiding officer, it gives clarity to the procedure to be followed, which is why the Law Society of Scotland supports this amendment. I move amendment 146 in my name. Thank you very much. And can I call Daniel Johnson? Thank you, uh, Presiding uh, Officer. I believe it's important that we make cutting off a tag an offence for the following reasons. First of all, when we look at the circumstances of Craig McCrown's death, one thing became clear was that there was a, a very significant number of people, unlawfully at large, who had realised that they could cut off their tag and that in and of itself did not constitute an offence and indeed that they had a good chance of escaping detection. That needs to be corrected. But more importantly, when we, uh, just in a moment, when, but most, more importantly than that, when we decide that someone has committed an offence that requires us to deprive them of their liberty, for them to tamper with the means by which we are restricting or removing their liberty, is extremely serious and I believe that should be an offence because if we can't monitor their whereabouts, we can't uh, uh, monitor whether they're abiding with that restriction of liberty, that must be considered an offence and must be treated. So it's not about uh, elevating that over and above other conditions, it's about recognising that this is the primary measure that we are using to remove or deprive people of their liberty in those circumstances. And I'll give way to the Cabinet Secretary if he Cabinet Secretary. Just on, on, on that tragic case which you mentioned, I know everybody's thoughts in the chamber will be with McClellan family. Does he recognise that the fact that we're bringing forward an offence of being unlawfully at large, actually in the case of James Wright, he would have been arrested because of the offence that we're bringing forward. So therefore I'm not sure it's a justification for bringing forward, uh, cutting off an attack being an offence. Daniel Johnson. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the intervention. He, he's right. I do welcome the new offence. I think it is an important step forward. And, and I think it does correct many of the issues. However, when someone, as Liam Kerr put it, um, goes over the prison wall, we don't wait for them to then rob a bank before we arrest them. We arrest them once they go over the wall. We shouldn't wait if someone cuts off a tag. That in and of itself should be uh, grounds for arresting someone. And can I call Fulton McGregor? Uh, thanks, President Officer. Um, I just want to speak briefly, as Liam Kerr in, in his um, speech mentioned me, and I just want to say that, um, for the record, that I didn't say 
that it would be regarded as punitive. I said that it could be regarded as overly punitive because the individual circumstances would not be taken into account. So I think there's a wee bit of a play in words there. And um, I, I think that the, the official record uh, would, would be able to show that. Um, I, I think that this, um, of course, a breach needs to be, uh, a breach of an electronic monitor needs to be taken seriously um, and needs to be dealt with robustly. There's nobody in this chamber that would disagree with that. But I think that we need to, to get the, the balance right and the measure needs to be right. And that's why what's been brought forward by the bill um, is, is, is the right way to deal with this and not to play simple politics with it. Thank you very much. And can I call on the Cabinet Secretary to wind up in this group? No, no further I'm comments to add. No That's fine. In that case, we're going to move to the question. And the question is that Amendment 104 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote on Amendment 104. This will be a one-minute division, and members may cast their votes now. Amendment 104. The result of the vote on amendment number 104 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary is yes, 68, no, 45. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I uh, call amendment 105 and ask Liam Kerr to move the amendment? Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment 105 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. This will be a 30 second division. The result of the vote on amendment number 105 in the name of Liam Kerr is yes, 45, no, 68. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 106 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Thank you. Can I ask Liam Kerr if he wishes to move amendment 106A? If this I is, wish to move. Th this is one of these amendments which leaves out monitor person and replaces with offender. I don't want to move it. Not moved. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 106 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, can I call Amendment 107 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet Secretary to move. Uh, moved. Thank you. Uh, I would just point out that, cabinet, that um, Amendment 107 preempts Amendment 108 in the name of Liam Kerr. Uh, the question is that Amendment 107 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We go to Amendment 109. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 109? Moved. Thank you. And again, in this case, I would point out that if agreed, 109 preempts Amendment 110. The question is that Amendment 109 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I'm now going to call Amendment 146 in the name of Margaret Mitchell, already debated. Margaret Mitchell to move. Moved. Thank you. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 146 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to division. Members, we cast their votes now. This is a 30-second vote. Amendment 146.
The result of the vote on amendment number 146 in the name of Margaret Mitchell is yes, 44, no, 69. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Now, before uh, I call amendment 111, can I ask Liam Kerr if he wishes to move any of the amendments 111A, 112, 113A, 114, 115A, 116, 118 and 120? Not moved. And can I just confirm that no other member wishes to move any of those amendments? No. They do not. Thank you. Um, I will turn, therefore, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 111, 113, 115, 117 and 119 already debated and move them on block. Moved on block. Thank you very much. Does any member object if I put a question on those amendments on block? No. No. Therefore, the question is that amendments 111, 113, 115, 117 and 119 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. We return now to Group 5, Enforcement of Fines and so on. I call Amendment 121 in the name of Lewis MacDonald in a group of its own and Lewis MacDonald to speak to and move the Amendment 121. Thank you very much. The purpose of my amendment is to address an anomaly in the law which was first raised with me by my constituent Michelle Gavin almost three years ago. An intruder broke her garden fence while trying to avoid a police officer. Rather than take him to court, the fiscal offered the intruder a fiscal fine, a compensation order requiring him to pay the householder £400 to fix her fence. When I raised her case at stage two in April, the money actually paid to my constituent amounted to £7.50. Thanks to the spotlight of parliamentary scrutiny, it has now risen to £15. That means that £385 remains outstanding three years after the damage took place. By any standard, the law has failed uh, my, that victim, just as it has many thousands of others, and that is why change is required. Michelle Gavin has received only a fraction of the compensation owed to her, in part because the perpetrator is under no legal obligation to provide information on his income, savings or benefits, or any other relevant information which would help ensure he paid the fiscal fine. It is far harder for the courts to enforce such an order, and that's why my amendment proposes to make completing the declaration of income form, uh, which uh, is uh, uh, relevant in this case, mandatory. When I moved a similar amendment at stage two, members suggested that it should make provision for reasonable excuse and that it should specify a time limit for completing the form. And I have addressed those points in the revised amendment. Perhaps more importantly, the Cabinet Secretary said at stage two that he would rather not rely on declaration of income forms since the necessary information could be obtained direct from UK government departments. And I am, of course, very open to that approach. The Digital Economy Scotland Act uh, 2017 contains provisions to allow the courts to obtain information about benefits and earnings directly from DWP and HMRC databases. But that requires Scottish ministers, of course, to bring forward the necessary regulations to allow the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to put the appropriate arrangements in place. So I have returned to this issue in order to discover from the Cabinet Secretary whether such regulations have been drafted and if so, when he expects them to be laid. <clears throat> I would also ask whether these regulations will ensure that data sharing will apply to fines which have not yet been paid, as well as to new cases decided after the regulations are passed. Michelle Gavin has already waited far too long. My purpose is to ensure that her case can be re revisited by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service using new powers to obtain uh, information uh, so that she can obtain the money to which she is entitled. Whether these powers come from this amendment or alternatively from government regulations on sharing data, and I look forward to the Cabinet Secretary's contribution and move Amendment 121 in my name. Thank you very much, Mr MacDonald, and I call on the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, as at stage two, when an almost identical amendment was voted down, I, I welcome Lewis MacDonald's interest in improving fines enforcement. Uh, the commitment of all parties to this important work is welcome, and I appreciate the fact that he is acting on behalf uh, of a constituent in uh, his region. Uh, fines collection rates in Scotland are high. I welcome the continuing efforts uh, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service puts into enforcement. Uh, recent statistics show that 90% of the value of Sheriff Court uh, and JP fines 
imposed during the three-year period between 2015-16 and 2017-18 had either been paid or was on track to be paid. I accept the remainder is a hard nut to crack, and I appreciate that's exactly what uh, Lewis MacDonald's amendment uh, is aimed at uh, trying, to, trying to sort. I'm clear that the, his amendments one to one, though, are not uh, the best way of going about this. Despite some changes being made uh, by Mr MacDonald uh, since stage two, the amendments uh, remain somewhat flawed. Amongst other issues, failure to obey a court order is a contempt of court. The penalties for contempt of court are set out in the Contempt of Court Act 1981. Uh, they depend on the court, but in all cases, they exceed the £1,000 set by Lewis MacDonald's amendment and include the possibility of imprisonment. So, in fact, the offence he is seeking to create does, um, doesn't even match the existing deterrent that's already in place. So there is no justification for creating a new criminal offence for conduct that can already be dealt with by a court. Uh, there are other technicalities that I could go into uh, if, if necessary. But more fundamentally, from a policy point of view, I'm concerned about the circularity, something I mentioned at stage two, of creating a new offence, attaching a penalty of a fine in precisely those cases where the individuals concerned have demonstrated their failure to engage with fine enforcement officers already. Um, I note that the offence appears to be little used in England and Wales, which suggests there's little point in creating one uh, up here in the first place. Uh, there is a better way of dealing uh, with this. Uh, Lewis MacDonald asked uh, the update from the government in terms of uh, regulations. Um, he's right, we do want the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to obtain relevant information about a person's income directly from the Department of Work and Pensions and HM, Re HM Revenue and Customs. Uh, so I can confirm to Lewis MacDonald that before the end of the year, we will be putting draft regulations before the Parliament to enable that to happen. Uh, what that means is instead of asking the defaulting individual for information about incomes and benefits, the fine enforcement officers would be able to obtain that information directly from DWP and HMRC. This will be a far more effective way, uh, I would suggest, of dealing with people who have already proved themselves reluctant to engage with the court service. It doesn't create a circular offence. Uh, in summary, despite some of the changes since stage two, uh, to his amendment. Yes, of course. Please, I'm, Donald. I'm very grateful and I welcome the commitment he's given in terms of time scale. Can I confirm that uh, when these regulations are passed, they will permit uh, the courts and tribunal service to pursue uh, defaulters for fines which have already previously been imposed and which have not yet been paid? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I don't know whether or not we have that ability to be retrospective, so you'll forgive me, I'm afraid I, I couldn't uh, say that until we draft the regulations, until we uh, come to a determination uh, with, with, our, with our own legal advice and, of course, uh, by speaking to DWP and HMM, HM Revenue and Customs. I do recognise a very important matter, particularly because of Mr McDonald's constituent that's been waiting three years for that fine to be imposed. So what I can say is when we return back from recess, uh, when we are drafting those regulations, perhaps I can meet with Mr McDonald to give him as much assurance as possible that we'll do everything we possibly can uh, so that people like his constituent and many others that may well be in that, uh, in that position, uh, that we can do what we can to help them to, to have those fines uh, paid off. So I will endeavour to involve him in some of that conversation around the drafting uh, of, the, of the regulation. So I hope for all the reasons that I've outlined, uh, Mr MacDonald will not press, but if he does, I'd ask members to, to reject his amendments. Thank you very much. And can I ask Lewis MacDonald to wind up and to press or withdraw in this amendment? Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I do welcome the commitment that the uh, Cabinet Secretary has made in relation to timing uh, and also his offer of a meeting to ensure that the changes that do go through Parliament are such as to assist in the case of Michelle Gavin and no doubt many other cases which are outstanding. I look forward to that discussion with him uh, soon after the summer recess, I hope, uh, and on that basis, I will not press this amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I just uh, confirm, is the Prime Minister happy for Mr. With Mr. MacDonald to withdraw this amendment? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Um, we turn now to Group 6, which is a group of minor and technical amendments, and can I call Amendment 122 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary grouped with the other amendments as shown in the groupings and call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak uh, and to move Amendment 122. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The, the amendments in this group are all minor technical amendments to tidy the bill up. I don't think anything will be controversial uh, amongst them, so I won't uh, keep members back by saying too much about them. Uh, amendments 122, 123, 133 and 136 ensure that the Prisoners and Criminal Proceedings Scotland Act 1993 is referred to consistently throughout the bill by the label of the 1993 Act. Amendments 131 and 132 adjust some language in section 43C that was added at stage two, so that it's consistent with the language normally used in provisions of this type. 
Amendment 143 corrects a typo. The word act appears once too often. Uh, the other amendments in this group move sections around to improve the accessibility of legislation. Everything that is about the parole board as an institution will sit in part three, and all the substantive provisions about prisoners will sit in a new part uh, after part three. Therefore, I move amendment 122 in my name. Thank you very much. And the question, therefore, is that amendment 122 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I turn to Group 7, the independence of the Parole Board for Scotland, and call Amendment 1 in the name of Daniel Johnson in a group on its own. Daniel Johnson to move and speak to Amendment 1. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And as I, I rise, I'm very mindful of uh, two key facts. First of all, the correspondence that I've had from the, the Cabinet Secretary, and I thank him um, for that. And also uh, my understanding that the Government does intend to bring forward legislation on the Parole Board. So I'll bear that in mind in, in terms of what is said in this, and I, and I don't intend to speak for long. However, the Parole Board does do a particularly important work in, in terms of its determinations of individuals and whether or not they uh, continue to pose risk to public safety and whether or not they should be relieved from prison. It's therefore critical that their work is carried out in an independent way. Their work is not always easy, requires fine and balanced uh, judgments, and therefore their independence is important. And I think that the independence that is in statute, uh, that we all have a duty to uphold in terms of the judiciary, should be mirrored uh, for the parole board. Um, however, I do recognise there may be uh, technical issues with this, um, uh, and I will uh, listen uh, to what the Cabinet Secretary has to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I call on the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Daniel Johnson uh, for his amendments? Can I also thank him for the constructive conversation we've had uh, in the various stages uh, of this bill? Can I also put on record, as Daniel Johnson does, uh, rightly, that the parole board uh, members do an incredibly difficult job, but they do it very well. Uh, it is a, a remarkably difficult job. Um, it is one that has to be, and rightly is, free from political interference um, and indeed governmental uh, interference. The independence of the parole board is something uh, that I think all of us uh, should unite uh, in, in, in defending, and I'm sure uh, we all do. So I do sympathise with the purpose of Amendment uh, 1, but I consider that Section 44 of the Bill goes far enough in reinstating the independence of the Parole Board. But also, perhaps, just uh, to be brief as possible, I'll touch upon where my, my, my areas of concern may be. The area that causes me most concern is the Scottish Minister's power to recall a person to custody for a breach of their licence conditions. It's my view that any such action to revoke a licence by Scottish Ministers would run contrary to the proposed amendment. It effectively involves Scottish Ministers revoking the person's licence as set out uh, by the Parole Board and could be seen by some as interfering with the Board's independence. I'm sure members will agree, where protection of the public demands it, it's appropriate that Scottish Ministers can make a decision to revoke a licence without having to wait for the next time the Parole Board will convene to consider the case. I'd be happy to expand with more detail on this uh, or indeed the other concerns um, should members so wish. But for the reasons I've, hi the reason I've highlighted, I believe this amendment uh, may have unintended and potentially damaging consequences to the overall parole system. I consider section 44 to be sufficient to restate the independence of the report, uh, parole board. Uh, I therefore ask Andrew Johnson not to press this amendment. And if he's otherwise minded, um, or, uh, urge other members to reject it. Thank you. And can I invite Daniel Johnson to wind up and to press or withdraw this amendment? Uh, very briefly, Presiding Officer, I've heard what the, the Cabinet Secretary ha has to say, um, and I understand the reservations. If the government does bring forward uh, legislation in uh, the, the, the coming months and years, I do think we do need to uh, consider very carefully the role of the Pro Board, both in terms of his independence and the fact that while in many respects it is a tribunal, um, uh, like much of what the other courts do, it is not identical and its role is important and needs careful consideration. But with the, the, the comments uh, in mind that the Cabinet Secretary has just made, I will not be pressing the amendment. Thank you very much. And can I, uh, I invite the Chamber to agree that Daniel Johnson may withdraw Amendment 1? That is agreed. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 123 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet Secretary to move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 123 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group 8. Prisoners' control of release on licence. Can I call Amendment 124 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendment 127, and ask the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 124? I, think also I move Amendment 124 uh, in my name. Amendment 124 
seeks to make a change to Section 3AA of the Prisoners and Criminal Proceedings Scotland Act 1993 in order to provide greater flexibility in the structure of HDC and to clarify the impact of HDC on the Parole Board's assessment of parole. The direct impact of this change will be minimal in terms of eligibility for HDC. However, I believe that in the context of historically high levels of prison population, this change is required so that ministers have sufficient powers to configure HDC differently in future, should they ever need to do so. I believe this is a prudent step to take now while there's an available legislative vehicle. Uh, this amendment firstly proposes a change in how the minimum amount of time spent in custody before becoming eligible for HDC is framed in legislation. Currently, a prisoner can only be eligible for HDC after serving one quarter or four weeks of their sentence, whichever is greater. Subsection 2 will change this so that a prisoner must simply serve one quarter of their sentence before they can be eligible for HDC. The Scottish ministers currently have a power to modify the requirement to serve a minimum of four weeks via subordinate legislation, but not the absolute minimum requirement for a prisoner to serve one quarter of their sentence. Uh, subsection 3 would enable the Scottish ministers via subordinate legislation to modify the minimum amount of time which must be served for HDC eligibility, should they ever need to do so. If it were ever necessary to change that minimum requirement that 25% of a sentence is served before someone became eligible for HDC, then any such proposal would come back to Parliament to approve under subordinate legislation, subject, importantly, to the affirmative procedure rather than requiring future primary legislation. This is a pragmatic change that would ensure a consistency with the already broad range of powers that ministers have to modify the HDC regime via subordinate legislation. Uh, Scottish ministers have the power to modify the following aspects of HDC via subordinate legislation. Uh, the minimum sentence, which a short-term prisoner must be serving to be eligible for HDC. Uh, that's currently three months. The number of weeks which must be served before a short-term prisoner can be eligible for HDC. The number of days leading up to the halfway stage of a prisoner's sentence during which the HDC can be granted. And the statutory exclusions from HDC. However, although the Scottish Ministers have a power to modify the minimum number of weeks served before eligibility, that's currently four weeks, there's no power to modify the requirement that one quarter of the sentence must be served. The requirement to have served a requisite amount of a sentence before being eligible for HTC remains a barrier to flexibility in how the system can be configured. Under the powers proposed, Scottish Ministers could change the minimum time which must be served before a prisoner can be eligible for HTC either by reference to a specific period of the prisoner's sentence or a specified period of time. The two-pronged approach of requiring either four weeks or one quarter of the sentence to be served is being replaced with a simple requirement to serve one quarter of the sentence, and ministers would retain a power to modify that requirement. I would stress, and I should stress very importantly, that we're not proposing to change the requirement that a prisoner must serve 25% of the sentence However, this amendment provides the flexibility for ministers, be it present or future, to work with Parliament to act quickly if ever required. While I would have preferred to have had the opportunity at committee stages of this bill to discuss and debate this change, uh, or indeed to have taken it forward under new legislation, the prison population has continued to change over recent weeks, with number, uh, prison numbers creeping steadily upwards. Uh, I feel, therefore, I have to consider acting now to ask Parliament to consider this option as a pragmatic future-proofing of the avail available policy responses. There are, of course, <coughs> other measures we're exploring in terms of operational capacity within the existing prison estate, and indeed looking across the operation of the entire justice system and seeking to address the rising prison population. Uh, this change to HDC is relatively minor in nature. However, the fact that it needs to be considered should perhaps make us all pause and reflect. We have the highest prison population per capita in Western Europe, not a statistic to be proud of. Uh, there has been positive collaboration on many parts of the bill to date, including the support of electronic monitoring as a form of alternative to prison. I hope that collaboration across parties will extend into future parliamentary terms, as it's important we continue to seek alternatives to incarceration across all our legislative and policy choices. The final change made by Amendment 124 is to clarify the, that the legislation underpinning HDC does not require the Parole Board to make a decision on parole by a specific date in order to enable a long-term prisoner to access HDC. Long-term prisoners are only eligible for HDC if they've been pre-approved for parole at the halfway stage of their sentence by the parole board. 
This amendment clarifies that the window during which a long-term prisoner can be granted HDC is restricted by the timing of the parole board's decision to recommend release on parole. The decision on parole takes precedence. It's not expedited in order to enable a long-term prisoner to spend a longer period on HDC. In terms of Amendment 127, excuse me, this change is being taken forward in response to Margaret Mitchell's original amendment at Stage 2, which proposed that statutory HDC guidance should be produced and laid before Parliament. As I indicated at Stage 2, I'm sympathetic to the intent behind the original amendment. I'm grateful to the convener, to Daniel Johnson and Liam Kerr, for working with us on this approach. I hope that this satisfies what they're looking for in this area. This amendment sidesteps two areas of concern with the previously drafted amendment. Uh, it avoids including material that duplicates other existing provisions in the bill. It also doesn't create a circular obligation on, the Scottish ministers, on Scottish ministers to have regard to their own guidance. What we're proposing is that Scottish ministers should be obliged to publish a statutory HTC operating protocol, which would include the following heads of information. The process of risk assessment that is carried out before a prisoner is released on licence under Section 3A, the factors taken into account in carrying out such risk assessments, the procedures for monitoring a prisoner while released on licence under Section 3A, the process for investigating a suspected failure to comply with a condition including a, in a licence under Section 3AA, and the process by which a licence under Section 3AA is revoked and a prisoner recalled to prison as, as a result. Uh, we have included a requirement that the police, uh, SCTS, local authorities, parole board and the risk management authority would have to be consulted in the preparation of the protocol. In addition, the protocol would require to be laid in Parliament with the, within six months of royal assent and therefore kept under review. Uh, finally, the inclusion on the face of the bill of two specific heads of information in relation to risk, uh, one on risk assessment and one on factors to be taken into account and carrying out such a risk assessment, we hope will satisfy what was being looked for by members in relation to risk. The heads of information contained in the amendment will ensure the publication of information about the entire HDC process, including the risk assessment prior to the grant of HDC, the monitoring of risk in the community, and the revocation of HDC. The requirement to lay the protocol before Parliament will also give Parliament an opportunity to scrutinise the risk assessment procedures utilised for the purposes of HDC. I urge members to support both these amendments and I move Amendment 124. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And I call Margaret Mitchell to speak. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In terms of Amendment 127, I'm, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for meeting with me to discuss the need for stronger risk assessment before electronic monitoring. As he says at stage two, I tried to push for robust risk assessment procedures and for details of the risk assessment tool to be shared with Parliament before the bill has passed. I'm pleased, therefore, that our discussions has at least led the Cabinet Secretary to lodge an amendment at stage three, which will ensure that the details of how risk uh, will be assessed, will be consulted on, and a report produced for Parliament within six months of royal assent if the bill passes today. And on that basis, I'm happy to support Amendment 127 in the Cabinet Secretary's name. Thank you very much. I'm going to call Daniel Johnson to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I begin by uh, expressing my support for Amendment 127? I think that is a positive step forward. Uh, my only regret with it is that it uh, doesn't have a legal obligation for that uh, guidance to be followed, which would make a substantive difference, and, but I'll cover that off uh, when we come to risk assessment later on in this debate. However, I would like to express my concern about Amendment 124, um, and I'd like to express that concern for three reasons. Uh, first of all, the rationale. And while I completely agree with the Cabinet Secretary, we must have a concerted effort to reduce our prison population, and we must seek alternatives to incarceration. I, I worry that this is a, a, a measure which, uh, making that intention explicit and solely about that, actually potentially uh, risks um, uh, uh, the, 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 the very intent that the Cabinet sets out to. Uh, we reduce the prison population by re re reducing offending, in my view, 
not by simply recategorizing people. Secondly, I worry about the power that he is giving ministers, allowing them to alter the minimum threshold before HDC. And I would worry uh, whether or not that is appropriate or not. And, and indeed, almost counterintuitive, because while I do believe we should be um, avoiding short prison sentences, in the end of the day, removing the threshold of four weeks, I, I, I would wonder what the point of sending to someone to prison for less than four weeks is. Um, and I just think that's counterintuitive. Now, and, and fundamentally and finally, is that simply Parliament has not had the ability to scrutinise this. And I think that is a huge regret. And for those reasons, I really do not believe that Amendment 124 can be supported. It perhaps could have been if it was introduced earlier, but I don't believe it can be, having been introduced at this late stage. Thank you. And I call on John Finney. Um, thank you, President Officer. Well, the Scottish Greens will be supporting both amendments, and I think they're a useful contribution to what's been a very detailed debate we've had about this whole issue, particularly the question of risk assessment. Um, I wonder if any summing up of the Cabinet Secretary could comment what likely impact this could have on the numbers, because it was very depressing to see the most recent figures we, 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 we saw about those being granted home detention, that there had been a significant drop, and this was no doubt due to the risk aversion that had built into the system. So if you could comment on that, but he certainly has our support in both of these amendments, please. And can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to wind up on this group? Thank you. I thank members uh, for, for the contribution. If I can maybe try to uh, focus on some of the questions that have been asked uh, of me in relation to, to, to 124. Um, in relation to, to, to Daniel Johnson's concerns, just to give him some reassurance, uh, it would be through the affirmative uh, procedures. Therefore, Parliament would have the ability to scrutinise and debate any changes. Uh, let me just put on record once again, as I did in my remarks, we are not proposing any changes uh, to that uh, minimum time uh, period. It's simply to allow ministers to have that flexibility. Um, in terms of, 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 of HDC, uh, what I would say, uh, similar to what John Finney has said, um, is that, that my belief is that the pendulum has perhaps swung uh, too far uh, in, in the other direction. The numbers are uh, very low in terms of those coming out uh, on, 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 on HDC. In fact, a number of members of this chamber have written to me to express their concerns about that very uh, point. Um, no, this is not about, uh, as he suggested, perhaps um, just recategorising people at all, but it is looking at the HDC regime as a whole uh, and seeing where sensible changes uh, can be made with always the protection of the public uh, first and foremost in our mind. In terms of um, scrutiny, uh, let, me, let me say that uh, our amendments obviously were lodged uh, by the deadline they were, they were meant to be. Uh, this is, of course... Uh, a good place to scrutinise them. Of course, if they could have been introduced earlier, um, I, I would have preferred that, so he'll forgive me that they, that they weren't. Um, to answer John Finney's point, we're not proposing any changes to the eligibility, so there wouldn't be a change in the numbers, but as he's aware, the two inspectorates, HMICS and HMIPS, uh, did a follow-up inspection of the review of HDC. I think there's a lot in there that would help to negate and mitigate some of that risk aversion, which I think he rightly talks about. Uh, and I think, therefore, with, again, the protection of the public, first and foremost, in our mind, um, it is possible to look at the HDC regime and ensure uh, that it is being used in, of course, a proportionate and balanced manner, uh, one that is giving people the, the opportunity to reintegrate uh, back into the communities and hopefully reduce uh, reoffending. Uh, and I thank Margaret Mitchell for the helpful comments uh, that she has made uh, uh, throughout the stages of this debate and indeed uh, just a moment ago in relation to my, my previous amendment. Thank you very much. So we turn to the question and the question is that amendment 124 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We're not agreed. We we'll move to a vote on amendment 124 and members may cast their votes now. This will be a one minute division on amendment 124.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 124 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary is yes 69, no 44. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. We're going to turn now to Group 9, the Parole Board for Scotland Decision Making, Provision of Assistance and Information. And can I call Amendment 3 in the name of Gordon Linters, grouped with Amendment 125, and ask Gordon Linters to move Amendment 3 and speak to all the amendments in this group. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I would uh, move Amendment 3. Uh, to put it very briefly, um, the purpose of this amendment is as set out in it, and it is to do with parole board hearings and basically seeking to ensure that a prisoner whose case the board considers is able to understand the matters discussed at the hearing. And the, in technical terms, it is simply to bring the provision for those who appear in front of the parole board into line with the provisions for those who are detained under the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003 and who have the uh, provisions made available to them as a result of that act. And the point is, of course, to provide in particular appropriate support for parole board hearings to, for example, vulnerable prisoners. So um, let me conclude with the words of the Cabinet Secretary in his letter to me of 10th June, and I quote, he said, it is clear that your suggestion has merit. Now, my delight at those words is uh, equaled only by my disappointment that I understand his intention is not to support my amendment today, but I, I do intend to uh, move the amendment and press it. Thank you very much. And can I call the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 125 and the other amendments of the group? Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I never uh, aim to disappoint, uh, but I'm afraid in, in this uh, case uh, I probably will. Um, if accepted, Amendment 3 uh, would result in a small part of the Pro Board procedure being provided in, in primary legislation, while the remainder would be provided in secondary legislation in the Pro Board Scotland Rules 2001. So while I think Gordon Linhurst makes a, a strong argument for the principle of what he's suggesting, I think all of us would unite around the principle of vulnerable prisoners being given uh, support in a way that Gordon Linhurst suggests. Largely, I have an issue with where that is and the unintended consequences of the problems uh, it may well uh, concur. Can I also thank Gordon Linhurst? He has been very constructive in his approach, although we have a disagreement about uh, his amendment. He has been very constructive in his approach, um, and, and, and we've tried to, try to reassure each other mutually uh, as best we possibly can. I also know that he comes at this from a point of uh, experience, of course, uh, in his own uh, professional uh, background, no doubt, uh, as well. So the result of, of this would be that any further changes to, to the provisions set out in this amendment would require a further act of the Scottish Parliament rather than being able to be taken forward via secondary legislation. In this instance, I remain of the view that it's entirely appropriate that matters for procedure uh, of the parole board should be provided for by secondary legislation. This provides us with the speed and flexibility to change aspects of the parole board procedure at a quicker pace, should the need to do so be identified. For this reason, I consider that matters relating to procedure are for the parole board rules rather than this bill. In addition, I know uh, Gordon Lindhurst and other members uh, will be aware of this, uh, the consultation transforming parole in Scotland, which closed on the 27th of March, included proposals to provide additional support to prisoners in the parole process. Uh, we are currently considering the responses to the consultation uh, and as I stated at stage two, and uh, I think in my letter to Gordon Lindhurst, um, when, when Gordon Lindhurst lodged a similar amendment at stage two, I consider the proposals in this amendment should be taken forward as part of the response to this consultation. I've already given uh, Gordon Lindhurst my assurance that this uh, would happen, but let me put it on record here once again. We're planning a revision of the parole board rules at a later stage, uh, once all potential changes to the rules have been identified. And if Gordon Lindhurst wants to meet with me in advance of that and to have a discussion in advance of that, of course, I'd be more than happy uh, to do so. Uh, if his amendment doesn't pass, uh, of course, uh, this uh, vote. Uh, notwithstanding my views on the appropriateness of this for primary legislation, I also have some considerable concerns with certain aspects of the amendment. Uh, these are in respect of the clarity of some of the terms used and as to the scope of the provision. Uh, I can expand on these matters if the member would like me uh, to do so. Uh, for these reasons, I would urge Gordon Lindhurst not to press this amendment. 
Uh, and if he does, I would ask members to reject it. Uh, moving to my amendment uh, 125, which I move uh, in my name, this amends section 40A of the bill as inserted at stage two by Mary Fee. Section 40A would make it mandatory that before making a recommendation to release a prisoner under section one of the Prisoners and, a criminal, uh, and Criminal Proceedings Act 1993, the parole board must take into account the impact of its decision on the prisoner's family and the ability of the prisoner to reintegrate with their family. Can I say from the offset, I am sympathetic to the intention of this provision. I also think it would be, uh, it'd be fair to put on record the amount of work, a tremendous amount of work Mary Fee has done in relation to the families of those who are in prison. I think it's also worth putting on record the great work of organisations like Family Outside uh, who have informed many uh, parliamentarians uh, in this chamber about the impact of imprisonment upon family members. So I am sympathetic, but I do have various issues, namely uh, that Mary Fee's uh, amendment that was passed at stage two, it lacks qualification and specification as to who would be considered, quote, unquote, a family member. Also, that the requirement is provided for in a mandatory sense, regardless of the relevant relevance to individual cases. For example, where the prisoner has no intention to contact the family, it would not seem appropriate. Uh, finally, I believe it could be difficult for the parole board to satisfy this requirement in all cases. In terms of obtaining the views of the family to enable them to consider the impact the prisoner's release may have on them. I have brought forward Amendment 125 to adjust the powers to make the Parole Board's rules of procedure to include specific reference to consideration of the likely impact of any recommendations of the Parole Board on prisoners' families. I believe this is a more flexible approach which will put reference to the impact on a prisoner's family of a recommendation to release in the face of the 1993 Act but allow for any detailed provision to be made in the Parole Board rules where I consider this is better placed and there is uh, more flexibility, as I've already mentioned in my response to Gordon Lindhurst's amendment. I would therefore urge members to support Amendment 125, which I move in my name. Thank you very much. And can I call on Lee MacArthur? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, President Officer, could I perhaps advise the Cabinet Secretary that he may come to regret the claim that he uh, never aims to disappoint, uh, but assure him that uh, on Amendment 125 uh, we will be supporting that and recognise the work that Mary Fee, uh, not just on the Justice Committee when she was a member of that committee, but uh, I think during her time in, in Parliament has, uh, has dedicated a great deal of time to uh, and made great strides on. I think in relation to uh, Amendment uh, 3, can I thank Gordon Lindhurst for bringing this back at Stage 3. I think he set out the case very well to the committee at, at, at Stage 2. Um, I'm grateful to him for sharing the correspondence that he and the Cabinet Secretary have had in the interim. And, and while I accept the Cabinet Secretary's point about not not wanting to build in too much rigidity uh, to the work of the parole board. I think that the general principles that are set out in, in uh, Amendment 3 are, are, are ones I find it difficult to, to see uh, altering over time. And, and I think the, the point is well made that, um, the, uh, that the wording reflects what is already in the 2003 uh, Mental Health Act. Uh, and therefore, for that reason, uh, we will be supporting uh, Amendment 3. Thank you very much. And can I uh, invite Gordon Linders to wind up or to add any comment to this stage? And to press a withdraw. Um, thank you. I, I have nothing further to add, Presiding Officer, but I do press the motion. Thank you very much. So the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now on Amendment 3. This is a one-minute division. Amendment 3, a one-minute division.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 3 in the name of Gordon Lindhurst is yes, 49, no, 64. There are no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 125, 126 and 127 on block? Uh, moved on block. Moved on block. Does any member object if I put these three amendments on block? The question therefore is that Amendments 125 to 127 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 2 and invite Daniel Johnson to move Amendment 2? Uh, moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members be cast their votes now. This will be a 30-second division on Amendment 2. The result of the vote on amendment number two in the name of Daniel Johnson is yes, 50, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 128 in the name of Daniel Johnson? Daniel Johnson to move. Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment 128 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now on amendment 128. The result of the vote on amendment number 128 in the name of Daniel Johnson is yes, 44, no, 68. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We turn now to group 10, Parole Board for Scotland Recommendations Publication of Test. Uh, can I invite Daniel Johnson to move and speak to amendment 129 in a group on its own? Thank you, Presiding Officer. As we've already heard this afternoon, the role that the Parole Board plays in our justice system is an incredibly important one but it can also be one that is uh, uh, finely balanced and one that's not always obvious in terms of the process uh, to those uh, outside the criminal justice system. Indeed, I believe that one of the most important things that we must uh, pursue in the justice system is transparency. And that's what this amendment seeks to do in uh, setting out the requirement for a statutory specification for a test or tests uh, under which uh, the Parole Board would carry out its decisions. The current position is that some tests are specified, but those vary, and the legislation is silent in other areas. That therefore leads to an inconsistent and confusing situation for all involved. And indeed, this is a, a, something that the Parole Board themselves brought forward in, in written evidence to the committee, and I believe that the adoption of a test will enhance transparency in the justice system. And can I also thank at this point uh, uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, for the dialogue that we've had in this regard. I, I believe that that has been incredibly uh, useful. Um, I, I would also like to point out to members that, that this amendment, while specifies a test, uh, leaves it to the Parole Board to uh, devise that and publish it, which I believe uh, provides for the flexibility that would be required in terms of taking this forward. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, rest my arguments there. Thank you. Thank you. Can I invite Liam MacArthur to speak? Thank you very, uh, very much, uh, President Officer. Just very briefly, um, I, I can understand the intent behind Daniel Johnson's amendment. I, I can't help but observe, though, that in the space of two groupings, he's gone from standing up for the independence of the Parole Board to an amendment that I, I think cuts across some of that uh, independence, uh, and therefore uh, I think we will not be supporting that amendment. I call on the Cabinet Secretary. I just simply say that I welcome Amendment 129 from Daniel Johnson at Stage 2. Uh, when Daniel Johnson brought forward uh, a similar amendment, I indicated uh, support in principle 
uh, subject to the removal of provisions uh, relating to the publication of a summary of parole board uh, recommendations, which I believe were suited better in the parole board uh, rules. So I'm pleased that Daniel Johnson has agreed to, to remove the requirement to publish a summary of the recommendations and therefore very happy to support the amendment in his name. Daniel Johnson, does Daniel Johnson wish to add any comments by way of winding up? I, I will just very briefly, presiding officer, just to Liam McCarthy's point. The, the, the critical point here is that this does not impose the test on the Pro Board, it simply requests that they, they publish it. The test itself would be for the, the Pro Board to devise. So th that is a, a critical point, which I believe leaves the independence of the Pro Board intact. Thank you. Thank you very much. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 129 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are, we're not agreed. In that case, we'll move to a, vis a division and members may cast their votes now. This is a one-minute vote on Amendment 129. The result of the vote on amendment number 129 in the name of Daniel Johnson is yes, 107, no, 5. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I call amendment 130 in the name of Daniel Johnson, which was debated previously? Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment 130 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. This will be a 30-second division on Amendment 130. The results of the vote on amendment number 130 in the name of Daniel Johnson is yes, 45, no, 67. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 131 to 137 on block? Uh, moved on block. Thank you very much. Does any member object if I put the question on, um, questions on amendments 131 to 137 on block? Very good. The question is that Parliament agrees amendments 131 to 137. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. Can I turn to Group 11, Assessment of Risk Posed by Offenders, and call Amendment 138 in the name of Liam Kerr, grouped with Amendment 139. Liam Kerr to speak and move to the speak the amendment. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is something that has concerned me right from the start. The Justice Committee's Stage 1 report recognised at Recommendation 182 that robust risk assessment procedures are critical to the effective use of HDCs and other forms of electronic monitoring. The committee agrees that decisions on electronic monitoring are informed by proper and appropriate assessments. Now, I've listened to representations throughout on this, and I acknowledge the Cabinet Secretary's willingness to discuss this, but I still come back to the same principle. Surely, before we do anything to increase the numbers of people on electronic monitoring, we must have a robust and trusted assessment tool. So my amendment simply requires the Scottish Government to develop that tool. It also requires the courts to have regard to the tool when disposing of cases and requires ministers to publish a report on the operation of the risk assessment tool. 
Now, at stage two, it was raised that there have been some improvements to HDC assessment. But I come back to the point I've made throughout that we cannot be too restricted in our focus on home detention curfew. We must apply rigorous risk assessment across all early release from prison. Furthermore, the Cabinet Secretary said it wasn't clear what the tool would look like, but I would respond that that is for the Scottish Government to determine, as the amendment clearly sets out. Flexibility for different forms of release on licence is not precluded. President Officer, for these reasons, the Bill requires the safety and reassurance provided by a risk assessment tool, and I commend the amendment to the Chamber. And for similar reasons, and for the avoidance of doubt, we will vote for Amendment 139 in the name of Daniel Johnson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Kerr. And I call Daniel Johnson to speak to Amendment 139 and the other in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As Liam Kerr has pointed out, the assessment of risk is absolutely critical uh, to this bill and indeed uh, following the events that have informed the passage of this bill. And if, again, I can quote, and this is not the first time I've uh, referenced this quote, um, from uh, the HMIPS report, uh, referring to risk assessment, uh, the, uh, the inspector said that whilst an assessment process clearly existed, it may not be regarded by some to meet the definition of robust. I think that is a very clear call for the requirement for a robust system of risk assessment to be put in place, and indeed, I believe, to make a, a, uh, a requirement by law. Now, I recognise that Amendment 127 does put in place guide, guidance around this, and that goes a long way towards meeting those requirements. However, that, as I said previously, there's no legal requirement to, to uh, apply uh, that, that guidance, which I think weakens that. And so while there may be recourse to judicial review, as everyone in this chamber will know, that you need to particularly deep pockets to take that course of action. So I think this legislation, this bill, would have been stronger if there was a legal requirement, not only to apply those guidelines, but to actually for that risk assessment to be carried out for people being put on HDC, and that being stipulated in black letter on the face of this bill. And I think it's with regret that that will, uh, uh, is being opposed by the government this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak to this group? I know that risk assessment was discussed in, in some detail during stage two uh, and as you know I brought forward my amendment uh, 127 at stage three to address some of these concerns. At uh, stage two risk management authority wrote to the justice committee expressing their concern about what was being proposed at that stage by Liam Kerr in relation to the development of a risk assessment tool. I know that both the risk management authority and the parole board have both written again to the justice committee expressing their concern about the return of the similar amendments 138 uh, and 139 at stage three. The approach the Scottish Government have taken of setting out the details of risk assessment in an operational protocol, which must be laid before Parliament, as I spoke to previously, provides further reassurance about risk assessment arrangements, without some of the practical problems that amendments 138 and 139 would cause. <laughs> in relation to 138, this is identical to Liam Kerr's amendment on risk assessment, which was rejected at stage two. Accordingly, all of the arguments presented at stage two uh, are apply here. Namely, there's no definition of quote unquote a risk assessment tool, so it's difficult to determine what the Scottish Government must do to comply with this obligation. It's not clear what sort of risk assessment tool would require to be created, uh, one to assist the decision to release a prisoner or one to assist the management of risk once the prisoner is released. Uh, also, the creation of one risk assessment tool for all forms of early release on licence, temporary release, HDC and parole, overlooks the very different nature of these various forms of early release. The duty to create a risk assessment a tool, tool would apply to all forms of release from prison, including automatic early release and release at the end of a prisoner's sentence. The Scottish ministers would be obliged to create a risk assessment process to assess the risk opposed, uh, posed by a prisoner who they are duty bound to release and who would be released unconditionally. Amendment 138 would also duplicate existing risk assessment processes across all forms of early release on licence. There are existing statutory provisions requiring risk assessment for the purposes of HDC, temporary release and indeed parole. There is a duty to consult certain bodies and it may be implied that those bodies are to have regard to the risk assessment tool. One of the bodies which must be consulted is the parole board, which is completely independent of Scottish ministers. Any implication that parole board is bound by a risk assessment developed by Scottish ministers could, of course, call into question that independence. It could also give rise to a potential challenge to the parole board's decision on parole under ECH Article 6. That's the right to a fair trial. 
Indeed, the Pro Board expressed concerns about this amendment and have written to the Justice Committee about this at Stage 2 uh, and, indeed, ahead of Stage 3. It is disappointing that it seems that these concerns have been ignored. As drafted, courts would have to take account of this tool when imposing a community sentence listed in Section 3.2 of the Bill. In imposing a community sentence, the court is not assessing risk for the purpose of release from prison, so this risk assessment tool would have very limited relevance. Courts are experienced in making assessments of risk. We must guard against creating legislation which risks impinging on judicial independence. Uh, I'd also note this amendment seeks to reintroduce the word offender back into the bill which the committee sought to exclude at stage three, at uh, stage two, and which we have uh, sought to exclude here at stage three. In relation to amendment 139, this amendment would also duplicate the existing statutory requirement to conduct a risk assessment for the purpose of releasing a prisoner on HDC. In addition, and more pressingly, there's a significant drafting concern that I think makes 139 unworkable as a risk assessment provision if, it's formed, if it forms part of the bill. The wording of subsection 1 makes it clear that the section applies where a person is subject to a curfew condition. This means that the section only applies after a decision to release has been taken. It would preclude any of the provisions being applicable to pre-release risk assessment. Accordingly, the duties relating to risk assessments in subsection 2 and 3 would be impossible to comply with, as those duties would only apply to prisoners who have already been granted HDC. Both of these amendments seek to address risk. However, primary legislation requ uh, already requires that there is a risk assessment prior to releasing an individual on HDC, temporary release or parole. Amendment 127 in my name would place an obligation on the Scottish Government to prepare and publish an operating protocol on HDC which would set out the procedure behind the HDC regime, including the process for risk assessment, as I have already discussed. I believe this approach is more robust than what is proposed in Amendments 138 and 139, while still meeting the intentions behind those amendments to ensure greater transparency behind the risk assessment process. Uh, accordingly, I urge members to reject these amendments, which are unnecessary uh, and, in some places, unworkable uh, and should not form part of this bill. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And can I call on Liam Carter to, wi Liam Carter to wind up in the section? <clears throat> yeah, I have nothing uh, particular to add, President Officer, other than to say to the Cabinet Secretary, look, it's abundantly clear from the drafting what it involves. Uh, I specifically said that there were other forms uh, not precluded, and I have to say I agree that it is regrettable that the Cabinet Secretary doesn't support development of a robust risk assessment tool, and I move Amendment 138 in my name. Thank you very much. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 138 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division on Amendment 138. This will be a one-minute vote, and members may cast their votes now. On Amendment 138. The result of the vote on amendment number 138 in the name of Liam Kerr is yes, 44, no, 68. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call, uh, invite Daniel Johnson to move amendment 139? Not moved. We're going to turn now to group 12, which is the mandatory FAI, fatal accident inquiry, where a person subject to a curfew condition commits murder. Can I call Amendment 140 in the name of Neil Bibby, grouped with Amendments 140A and 141, and invite Neil Bibby to move Amendment 140 and to speak to all the amendments in this group. 
Th thank you, Presiding Officer. Members across the Chamber will be well aware of the tragic case of Craig McClelland. His murder should never have happened and it should never have been allowed to happen. As the committee noted in their Stage 1 report, the Justice Secretary asked both HMIPS and HMICS to conduct reviews into the HDC regime. However, these reviews were described simply as process reviews by the government and they were not specifically tasked with looking at what went wrong in this case and why. Recommendations were made, some of which are being acted on today, which is welcome, but they also established there had been significant failings leading up to the murder. Yet there has not been a specific inquiry into why that this was allowed to happen and whether it could have been prevented. I believe a full independent inquiry is required to investigate the system failures that led to this death, to help the McClellan family find the answers that have been eluding them, to hold the state and the authorities to account, to do so under the independent leadership and direction of a sheriff, and to allow the sheriff to make recommendations on what has to change if this kind of tragedy is to be presented in future. Because an inquiry is not just in the interest of a family searching for answers, it's clearly and demonstrably in the public interest too. If an independent inquiry is not granted willingly by the government or by the Lord Advocate using his discretionary powers, then the law must change to make it mandatory. Section 2 of the Inquiries and Sudden Deaths Act 2016 should be amended to include cases where a murder is committed by a prisoner on a HDC. If a fatal accident inquiry is commonplace for deaths on the prison estate, then why as a principle is it not automatic in cases where a prisoner commits a murder in the community? The amendment differs from the amendment I brought to the committee at stage two. The cabinet secretary was concerned that the drafting had been too broad and I had not specified which deaths would be captured by the amendment. The redraft clarifies that it would apply only to cases where a murder is committed by someone subject to a curfew condition. There was also some debate at stage two of whether it was right that the parliament so soon after the passage of the 2016 Act should review whether FAIs are mandated automatically. Presiding officer, it is my judgment that the circumstances in the McClellan case are so important that timing becomes a secondary consideration. Where someone in a tag commits a murder, the system has failed. There absolutely must be an inquiry. It is not a technical question. It is not a legalistic question. In fact, there should be no question about it at all. If Parliament believes that tag murders should be subject to the FEI regime as a matter of principle, then it can vote to change the law today and make it happen. Over 5,000 people have signed a petition calling for an inquiry to take place, not just in this case, but in any other tag murder. The power to change the law and do right by the McClellan family is in our hands. I would urge members across the chamber to back my amendment, do the right thing and do what it takes to make sure the lessons of this tragedy are fully learned. Thank you. Can I call on Liam Kerr to move Amendment 140A and speak to the amendments in this group? Thank you, Presiding Officer. Just very briefly, I'm very pleased to support this cross-party effort to ensure not only that Craig McClellan's family get the answers they've been denied, but that other such tragedies and failures of the justice system are comprehensively investigated in future. My Amendment 140A expands the scope of Neil Bibby's amendment to cover all prisoners released from prison on licence. I see no reason why there should not be a robust inquiry into every death caused by someone who is released early from prison, because the authorities responsible for the release have to be answerable in those cases. And I therefore move Amendment 140A in my name. Thank you very much. Can I call John Finney to be followed by Liam MacArthur? John Finney. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, thank you, uh, Sergeant Officer. This is fundamentally a debate about uh, whether the discretion that's afforded the Lord Advocate to act in the public interest is uh, sufficient to address these concerns. Um, or whether it should be on the face of this legislation, it's always the case. Now, the obligation is, as I say, to act in the public interest. And I have to say, unquestionably, I think the public interest would be served by having a, an inquiry in this instance. However, I don't support it being mandatory. I, I, I also, um, um, as a secondary issue, wonder if it, it's limited by having the word murder in there. I mean, if there was a death to result in someone, it was in a finding of culpable homicide, would that... Um, that, that wouldn't appear to apply in this instance. But I, I think the discretion should remain with the, the Lord Advocate, and I hope he exercises the discretion to call an inquiry in this instance. Liam MacArthur, to be followed by Joanne Lamond. Thank you. Can I commend uh, Neil Bibby on bringing forward his amendment um, and I think heeding uh, some of the uh, issues that were raised at, at, at stage two. Uh, I think he's absolutely right to point out uh, the fact that not only in this case is it the McClellan family who are left uh, waiting for answers, but actually 
uh, in terms of um, the, the, the public uh, more generally, um, the absence of, of, um, uh, of answers to, to what went wrong in this instance and uh, how we go about putting them right, uh, I think uh, heightens the level of risk. So uh, while I accept um, John Finney's concerns uh, around uh, the, uh, the, the issue in relation to uh, the Lord's Advocate's discretion, I think the concern here is that the Fatal Accident Inquiry system at present um, is encountering far too many delays uh, and I think that is something that absolutely needs to be addressed and uh, for that uh, reason we will be supporting uh, the Amendment 140 in Neil Bobby's name. I call on Joanne Lamond. Thank you. Um, this is a debate around curfew measures and so on has been something that's been part of the parliamentary debate since the very first days um, of the parliament itself. And it is essential, if we're going to move to this system and support this system more, that people feel confident. They have to feel confident that it's monitored properly and that there are consequences to the breach. And I think, therefore, an issue where if somebody in prison killed another person in prison, there would be an automatic fatal accident inquiry. Somebody whose liberty has been um, restricted but are on a home detention curfew, logic tells me that they should too have a fatal accident inquiry. It's essential, in my view, to have confidence in the system that we don't treat them differently, but we recognise that the, the, the same thing has happened. Um, John Finney talks about it uh, not being mandatory, but it is mandatory if it's in prison or if it happens in a care setting. We have to explain why it would not be mandatory in these circumstances. I believe it's our duty to support individuals who come to us in tragic circumstances, not just to support them, but to understand why it happens and look at the process or the system or the law that is not doing the right thing. And I think this amendment very simply ensures that the experience of somebody like the family in this circumstance is treated the same as if it had happened in prison itself. And I would certainly be very pleased if there is cross-party support for something that recognises a gap in a process and would give confidence to the system if it was addressed by this amendment. Thank you. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak to this group. Thank you, President Officer. Before I speak to the amendment, can I also once again put on record uh, my sympathy and sympathy of the government to the family, to the, to the McClellan family. Um, and I also know that a number of members right across the chamber have met with the McClellan family, uh, have come to me. I know they've spoken to the Lord Advocate also. Uh, about changes in the law that they may want to see and uh, other circumstances surrounding this case which they would wish to see uh, improved. Uh, can I thank those members for the constructive way in which they've had those conversations uh, where there has been agreement and in some cases, of course, where there has not been agreement uh, on the way forward. I don't doubt the sincerity of everybody involved in trying to get a, uh, as, as possible, get a better system uh, around HDC uh, after the tragic murder of, of, of Craig uh, McClellan. Uh, Amendment 140 um, is similar to the one brought forward by Neil Bibby at stage two. I remain, as I say, sympathetic to the aims of the amendment, but the Scottish Government must resist uh, for the same reasons I outlined at stage two. Uh, the categories of mandatory FAIs were considered and legislated for in the context of the inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden deaths, Scotland Act 2016, that passed Parliament with unanimous support. Uh, of course, I will. Joanne Lamond. I understand the argument about timing, but this case challenges what that legislation offered. And if it challenges it, we need to address it. It's something very straightforward. It's expanding a category which is already mandatory if the person was murdered in prison, but not if the person's outside prison with the same conditions as if they were in prison. It is something that has emerged since, and surely we have a responsibility to respond to that because we can do it and use this legislation as a means of doing so. Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank uh, Joanne Lamont for her intervention? It's worth just giving some context. The previous changes that were made uh, in 2016 that were passed were after a careful review by Lord Cullen and very lengthy con consultation and indeed lengthy parliamentary uh, consideration. In terms of Joanne Lamont's point around bettering the system of HDC after a tragedy. Of course, we should not be close-minded to changes after a terrible tragedy like the one that the McClellan family have suffered. That is why we have, I would say, a more robust and a better HDC process uh, now in place that came in the back of the Independent Inspectorate's uh, review. Uh, in terms of our considerations in 2016, the, the end result was a scheme that specified a mandatory FAI in the narrow circumstances of death and custody. <laughs> 
and death in the course of a person's em em employment. I think we have to take great care um, before making uh, any changes. And as I say, they followed lengthy consultation uh, and consideration. Um, I do not favour the addition of further categories of mandatory FAI. These matters, uh, th I think these would fetter the Lord Advocate's discretion. Uh, and for example, may result in a requirement to hold an FAI, even if the circumstances are straightforward, albeit tragic, and the bereaved families do not want one. Where the circumstances justify it, the Crown will undertake a death investigation and may, in addition to any criminal proceedings, investigate any other matters which bear in the circumstances of the death and indeed instruct a discretionary FAI, as is the case uh, for, for, for the tragic case of, of Craig McClellan. The Crown have the ability to instruct an FAI and, of course, this currently sits with the independent Lord Advocate for consideration. The Crown will always engage with the families of the victims in that regard, both in the context of the criminal proceedings and under the Family Liaisons Charter in relation to any wider death investigation. There are accordingly mechanisms whereby, if appropriate uh, cases, an investigation will be undertaken, uh, as I say, into such uh, cases. The ordinary course in the 2016 Act is that even in the case of mandatory FAIs, uh, as I say, the Lord Advocate may determine that circumstances have been adequately established in relating, uh, related to criminal proceedings and determine on that ground that an FAI would not be justified. Uh, there is no equivalent qualification in the proposed amendments where it will be certain that there would be related uh, criminal proceedings. I know that this, as I say, this amendment has been lodged by Neil Bibby uh, after the tragic case of Craig McClelland. Uh, and as I say, as things stand, I know that the Lord Advocate uh, is considering the specific circumstances uh, of that case. Um, and, and, and of course, it's for him to, to make that determination. Finally, on, on points of, of, of drafting, um, firstly, the requirement for a murder conviction might produce odd results if an FAI is required in that circumstance, but not in a culpable homicide conviction, as John Finney mentioned in his remarks. Uh, secondly, it may also be strange for an FAI to be mandatory in the case of a murder committed by an individual in HDC, but for example, not by an individual on parole or temporary release. Thirdly, it's most unusual to make retrospective provision in any legislation and a specific policy justification would be required, given the existing powers to order a discretionary FAI I'm not convinced that retrospective application of this provision is justified. Uh, for this reason, I provided, uh, I would ask that Neil Bibby uh, does not press the amendments, but if he does, then I'd urge the Parliament to reject them. Uh, amendment 140A, in the name of Liam Kerr, is a minor change to Amendment 140 to, to refer to those released on licence under Section 3AA of the 1993 Act, rather than those subject to a curfew condition under Section 12AA of the Act. Uh, these two groups are the same as those released on HDC licence under Section 3AA will be subject to a curfew, con curfew condition under Section 12AA. In any event, I'd urge Parliament to reject the underlying Amendment 140. I'd also urge Parliament to reject Amendment 140A. Amendment 141 in the name of Neil Bibby would add Amendment 140 to the list of provisions in Section 49 of the Bill, which are to be commenced on royal assent. Again, as I would urge, uh, again, I would urge Parliament to reject the underlying Amendment 140 and urge Parliament to reject Amendment 141. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I invite Neil Bibby to wind up on Amendment 140? Thank you, President Officer. We've heard a number of different arguments in the Chamber, but I've not heard a principled argument against making a fatal accident inquiry automatic in cases like this one. And beyond no doubt, this is a matter of principle. The precedent that this Parliament can make legislation to mandate a fatal accident inquiry has already been set. The question for the Chamber today is whether we believe in principle inquiries into tag murders should be required or not. I believe they should. I also believe that any change in the law should be backdated to include the McClellan case. And I believe that a full independent inquiry is now essential if we are to restore public confidence in HDCs and the justice system. And as Joanne Lamont said, if after everything they have been through, the family of Craig McClellan still do not have confidence in the HDC system, then how can any of us who are passing this legislation today? What happened to Craig McClellan should never have happened. It was a tragic failure of the system that should have kept him and his community safe. Across this chamber, there are MSPs who believe that a fatal accident inquiry is needed, and I very much welcome what John Finney said in his contribution about that. There are over 5,000 people in our communities that agree that this inquiry should have started by now. To the members saying that this amendment is not needed or that the Lord Advocate has discretionary powers, I would say this tragedy is a case study in why they are wrong. 
This amendment is necessary because there hasn't been a public inquiry. This amendment is necessary because the Lord Advocate has yet to instruct a fatal acts inquiry and there's nothing on the statute compelling him to do so. President officer, I will support the amendment in the name of Liam Kerr because I can accept the argument for extending the scope of my amendment, but I cannot accept that my amendment is unnecessary. And I'll conclude on that point. Throughout stage two and stage three, we've heard government and members in the chamber with positions searching for arguments rather than arguments to justify their position. Discra disgrace is an overused word in political debate, but I have no hesitation in saying it would be a disgrace if this amendment were to be defeated today. But defeat for this amendment does not mark the end of the fight for a fatal accident inquiry. I would say to all those who have expressed sympathy with the family, all those who have been shocked and moved by what has happened, all those appalled at the indifferences with the McClellans have been treated, and I would say to the Lord Advocate too, that come what may, the case for an inquiry into the McClellan case is impossible to ignore, and it's unthinkable that it should be refused. And can I ask Liam Kerr if he wishes to add any comments on Amendment 140A and to press a withdrawal? Uh, the only comments I wish to add are that I associate myself and my colleagues with Neil Bibby's comments in that regard uh, and move Amendment 140A in my name. Thank you very much. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 140A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We will move to a vote, and this will be a one-minute division on Amendment 140A. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 140A in the name of Liam Kerr is yes, 50, no, 63. There are no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 140 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. This is a 30 second division. <coughs> The result of the vote on amendment number 140 in the name of Neil Bibby is yes, 50, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We turn now to group 13, restriction of liberty orders. And can I call amendment 147 in the name of Margaret Mitchell in a group on its own and Margaret Mitchell to move and speak to the amendment. Well, thank you, presiding officer. Amendment 147 is similar to my previous amendment at stage two. The amendment seeks to amend the Criminal Procedure Scotland uh, 1995 Act to impose particular restrictions of liberty for uh, offenders. In particular, this amendment is aimed at and intended to focus upon domestic abuse cases and prevent offenders from causing further distress. At stage two, the Cabinet Secretary express, uh, expressed concern that Examples such as a partner's house or a child's school were explicitly men mentioned in the amendment and therefore in the bill. In response, 
I have removed the for example references, leaving it to Scottish ministers to specify places that must be excluded. And as such, the amendment will prov provide an extra safeguard to domestic abuse victims where perpetrators are released on electronic um, tag. And I, I move amendment 147 in my name. Thank you very much. Ms Mitchell, can I call Fulton McGregor? As the convener of the Justice Committee said there, we actually discussed this uh, amendment in stage two also, and I'm still not clear uh, today um, what difference um, the amendment would make in a real uh, practical sense if it was to be passed, because a court, um, as we know, can already yeah. uh, designate a specified place um, through an RLO and, and actually does so uh, regularly. I do acknowledge that the, the convener uh, is attempting to work alongside Women's Aid, but I'm not sure that this particular amendment will, will deliver on the key concerns that they have because it is limited to only uh, one form of monitoring and I think that actually the passing of the, the recent domestic abuse uh, legislation by this government is a much more holistic approach to tackling the scourge of domestic abuse and I don't think that this amendment goes anywhere near to achieving that. Thank you very much and can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to comment? <coughs> Thank you, uh, President Officer. Some of the challenges with this amendment remain uh, as they were when the amendment was lodged in largely similar terms and was rejected at stage two. I do not believe there's a requirement for this additional ability for ministers to prescribe a specified place. Courts already are able to restrict people on, on an RLO, a restriction of liberty order, away from or to a broad range of types of specified places. And they already do so under the current radio frequency service. People can currently be restricted away from, for example, a partner's house. Uh, courts have, under the current service, used electronic monitoring to make at local supermarkets a quote-unquote specified place to deter persistent shoplifters. Uh, a restriction of liberty order may, and I'm going to directly quote from section 245A of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 here, they may, and I quote, restrict the offender's movement to such extent as the court thinks fit and without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing may include provision A, requiring the offender to be in such place as may be specified for such periods or period such period or periods of each day or week as may be specified, or B, requiring the offender not to be in such place or places or such classes or classes of place or places at such time or during such periods as may be specified, end quote. Uh, these are already broad powers. The GPS monitoring capabilities when introduced will just change the way in which those specified places are monitored. We do not see any need to change how those specified places are actually defined. Indeed, there's a significant risk that if ministers were to further prescribe in legislation the places that can be specified in an RLO, it might limit the power of the court to only specify those places which are uh, therefore prescribed. We're unsure why the ability to prescribe the places which may be specified in an RLO, if it were to be beneficial, would not extend to other forms of electronic monitoring, such as monitoring of licence conditions or of sexual offences prevention orders. Overall, this bill has largely sought, sought to leave untouched the underlying orders that can be electronically monitored, as, as uh, to do so risks opening up a number of unintended consequences that we've not had the opportunity to consider as part of the evidence taken on the bill to date. On that basis, I cannot see a clear benefit from an amendment of this nature. I'd urge Margaret Mitchell not to press it, and if the amendment is pressed, I uh, urge members to reject it. Thank you very much. And I would call on Margaret Mitchell to wind up and to press or withdraw this amendment. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Presiding Officer. To respond to both um, Fulton McGregor and the Cabinet Secretary's um, point about courts more certainly having the power to list specific places where the perpetrator could be um, excluded from, in reality and in practical terms, very often procurator fiscers are under such pressure that they're handed case notes as they go into uh, court and may not be in possession of all the full facts, including areas that should be specified under the exclusion zones. This gives the power in these circumstances for that to be rectified by going to ministers um, to allow them to fill in the gaps. And on that basis, Cabinet Secretary, um, I move the amendment my name. Thank you. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 147 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote on Amendment 147. Members may cast their votes now. This is a one-minute division on Amendment 147.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 147 in the name of Margaret Mitchell is yes, 27, no, 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I ask Neil Bibby if he wishes to move Amendment 141, previously debated? That is not moved. Can I turn now to Group 14, Commencement Provisions, and I call Amendment 142 in the name of Liam Kerr, and I ask Liam Kerr to move and speak to this amendment. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the consequences of this bill is that there should be a considerable expansion of the use of community censuses in a context in, in which nearly one in three are not completed. Now, we've heard in the context of the presumption SSI that there are a number of challenges within the community system already, and I cannot see that it is wise to significantly increase the numbers going into that system without first having ensured that those challenges have been addressed. And secondly, that the stated goal of promoting rehabilitation and preventing reconviction is able to be achieved. To that end, it seems sensible to me to put increased resources into the community system, develop, deliver a modest improvement to the completion rate, and then start from a position of strength and confidence when pushing more criminals into that system. Now, at stage two, some in committee raised points about the complex reasons that community orders are not completed and the often chaotic lifestyles of those on them. I don't dispute that, but that, I think, makes my point for me. Before pushing more of these people into that system, surely we need to reassure ourselves that the services are there to support people to serve that sentence. Because if the support is not there, or may not be there, the offender should not be in the community. And I think that is a key point. Victim Support Scotland told the committee that, and I quote, communities have no faith in community sentencing. I take their word for it. The basic improvement called for by this amendment can help to give that confidence to the public and victims that community orders are a robust alternative to prison. And we must set ourselves a high bar to ensure community orders are as much a deterrent as prison and that they'll keep the public and victims safe and are seen to achieve the punishment that is one of the tenets of that system. To that end, I propose a modest amendment which may help to achieve that, and I move it in my name. Thank you very much, Mr Kerr. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Lee MacArthur. Daniel Johnson. Uh, I'm just going to rise, speak very briefly uh, against this amendment. I mean, I think that it is simply a, a wrecking amendment. Um, uh, and one which I think is also based on a false premise. There's nothing in this bill in and of itself which necessitates the expansion of community orders or the, the increasing use of tags. What this simply does is allow new technology to be applied. Now, I agree with one thing that Liam Kerr said, which is that we should see considerable increase in investment in com co uh, community uh, sentences. I, I believe that is required. I don't believe that we spend uh, enough on that in order to make them successful. But I don't believe this amendment should, should essentially make it uh, put considerable delays in, uh, on the introduction of the use of this new and very useful and valuable technology for tagging, and I don't think that's acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. I entirely agree with the sentiments expressed there by uh, Daniel Johnston. This does seem to me a, a wrecking amendment. All the evidence shows that in terms of rehabilitation, uh, community-based sentences have a better track record uh, than incarceration, particularly for short prison sentences. And by Liam Kerr's own logic, uh, the lack of resources within uh, the prison estate at, at the present time in order to support uh, those uh, emerging back into the community uh, would suggest that we shouldn't be sending them to, to prison in the, in the first place. So, uh, as I did at, at stage two, uh, I will be uh, opposing uh, the amendment. And, and as I say, I think it stands the evidence on its head. The Secretary. Thank the contributions of that both. Can I thank Daniel Johnson and, and Lee MacArthur for their contributions? I uh, also, of course, would urge uh, members to reject Amendment 142. They're very similar to amendments that he brought at stage two that the committee rejected uh, at that time. A couple of points to make about the amendment. Um, it does seem to me uh, pretty perverse, actually, to tie commencement uh, of the bill to community payback order completion uh, rates. One of the things that bringing this act into force will do is allow electronically monitored restricted movement requirements to be imposed as part of a CPO as a first disposal in a case. We know that when similar requirements have been imposed through restriction of liberty order, completion rates have actually exceeded um, 80%. Mr Kerr's amendment insists that completion rates increase first and only then are the tools to help improve completion rates 
that this bill offers to become uh, available. Um, I suppose it's kind of like saying you can have the Allen keys only after you've finished assembling uh, the flat pack. Um, the effects of Amendment 142 in relation to the parts of the bill that are about CPOs um, would, as I say, be perverse. The amendment is all the more bizarre because it links CPO completion rates to the commencement not only of the bits of the bill that are about CPOs, but to the commencement of everything in the bill. So why should the coming into force of the rules about disclosure of convictions or the power to arrest prisoners unlawfully at large or the provision about appointments to the parole board, why should all of these things depend on CPO completion rates? It doesn't really make um, any sense. Uh, Liam Kerr talks about a deterrent and we have to ensure that CPOs are deterrent on that logic. Uh, unfortunately, of course, short prison sentences, which we're looking to bring forward a presumption against, of course, which his party rejected. Uh, short sentences, people are convicted nearly twice as often than they are uh, when they are given a community alternative. So by his own logic, then short, community sent uh, short custodial sentences are in no way uh, a deterrent. So where would uh, those who have committed uh, a crime uh, end up? So for all those reasons and the reasons mentioned by Daniel Johnson and Lee MacArthur, I'd urge members to reject Amendment 142. Thank you, Anna Colin. Liam Kerr to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 142. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. Just to, really to say, I mean, this is not a wrecking amendment at all. I have to say I'm a bit disappointed in the lack of ambition shown by the various members who spoke. I still cannot accept that it isn't sensible to ensure that the system is working before increasing the pressure on it. And in that regard, I remain on the side of Victim Support Scotland, even if no one else does. For which reason, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And the question is that Amendment 142 be agreed. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now, and this will be a one-minute division on Amendment 142. Thank you very much. The result of the vote in Amendment Number 142 in the name of Liam Kerr is yes, 26, no, 86. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call Amendment 143, Cabinet Secretary, to move? I moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 143 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That con ends consideration of amendments. Now, at this stage, members may be aware I am required under standing orders to decide whether or not any provision in this bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral franchise or system for Scottish parliamentary elections. It does no such thing, in my opinion. Therefore, it does not require a supermajority at stage three. Now, before we move to the debating stage, I propose taking a short break to allow members to just refresh themselves. We will resume at 10.2, so or a 10-minute break. 10 minutes suspension in fact so parliament is suspended until just after 10 to 7 10 to 6 <laughs>
The next item of business is statutory debate on motion 17893 in the name of Hamza Yousaf on the management of Offenders Scotland Bill. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Hamza Yousaf to speak to and move the motion for up to seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Remind me never to get on your wrong side. Um, I very much, uh, of course, move the motion uh, in my name. I'm very pleased to be opening this stage three debate on the management of offenders Scotland Bill. Firstly, of course, I'd like to thank members uh, and clerks of the Justice Committee for their very thoughtful and diligent consideration of this bill at stages uh, one and two. I know we've not uh, obviously agreed on everything, neither we ever should, I think, uh, in these matters, uh, but I know that the conversation has been uh, both uh, sincere but also very constructive uh, as well. As members will know, uh, additional evidence was taken on the bill in light of the tragic murder uh, of Craig McClelland, as has been referenced uh, in, the, uh, in, in the Stage 3 uh, amendment discussion. I'd like to extend once again my sympathies to his family. We were asked in June 2018 by Craig's family to respond to the circumstances of his death. We were also asked by members of this parliament how we would respond. I know, for example, Ruth Davidson asked us to consider the creation of a further offence. Uh, we have listened uh, and we did respond. We accepted an additional punitive element was needed for home detention curfew and that a new offence was appropriate. We created the offence that HMICS recommended uh, and uh, that, that we consider. The bill creates the new offence of remaining unlawfully at large <clears throat> and it also improves the available powers of recall from home detention curfew. Those legislative measures sit alongside a significant number of operational improvements that have been made to HDC. In May of this year, the follow-up reports from Her Majesty's Inspector of Prisons and indeed HMICS showed positive progress against their recommendations. I'd also like to record my thanks to colleagues in Police Scotland and the Scottish Prison Service and indeed their respective uh, inspectorates for the work they have undertaken to date to strengthen the HDC regime. Uh, this is unlikely, I know, to provide uh, much, if any, comfort to Craig's family for the loss they've suffered but the improvement of the HDC regime, I think, are the right steps uh, for us to have taken. With this legislation, we've sought to make important and progressive reforms designed to deliver on the Scottish Government's commitment to reduce reoffending, ensuring that Scotland's justice system retains its focus on prevention and, importantly, rehabilitation, while maintaining public safety and enhancing support for victims. I think, Presiding Officer, we have got that balance absolutely right. In relation to various parts <coughs> of the bill, in relation to part one of the bill, it provides for the expansion of electronic monitoring as part of our continued development of community-based alternatives to prison. The electronic monitoring provisions of the bill provide an overarching set of principles for the imposition of electronic monitoring. The bill provides clarity as to when and how electronic monitoring can be imposed either by the courts in relation to criminal proceedings or by Scottish ministers in relation to release on licence from detention or imprisonment. The bill also creates a standard set of obligations which clearly describe what is required of an individual who is subject to monitoring. The bill also empowers ministers to make regulations to specify the types of devices that can be used for the purpose of monitoring. The introduction of new technologies such as GPS technology presents opportunities to improve the effectiveness of electronic monitoring, for example, through the use of exclusion zones that could offer victims additional reassurance. Electronic monitoring using just the existing RF uh, radio frequency technology that we have available today has proven itself to be an effective tool available to the justice system. We look forward to working with our partners in the justice system to develop services around the new technological uses which the bill enables. Uh, we will use electronic monitoring in a proportionate way to target further reductions in reoffending providing structure to monitoring to keep people safe and secure and helping people move on with their lives fro away from the justice system. In terms of part two of the bill, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, part two of the bill is about reforming the system of disclosure of past convictions when wanting to gain general employment, for example, working in a shop or an office or when apl applying for home insurance. Members will be aware of the recently introduced disclosure bill, which is seeking to reform higher level disclosure which is used to protect vulnerable groups. This bill does not directly change higher level disclosure in any way. The current length of disclosure periods are too long. Uh, that has created an imbalance between the need for general protection for the public 
and allowing people to move on with their lives, part two seeks to rebalance this issue. The evidence is clear. A system that requires too much disclosure can have a negative impact on people's lives. I was struck, presenting officer, by members of this chamber who told me they had interacted with the likes of uh, the WISE Group, for example, an excellent organisation. And those people that had previously committed crimes had been in prison, uh, and they often talked about the fact they wanted to move their lives on. But the stigma around disclosure, but actually the real practical impact of disclosure, meant that they felt, and at least there was this perception, if not the reality, the perception that their CVs or their job applications were put straight in the shredder uh, once that application uh, for disclosure uh, was received. So uh, this bill will reduce the periods of disclosure for the majority of sentences. It will bring more people within the scope of the protections under the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974. It will increase the clarity, accessibility and terminology used in the legislation. Part two will see the most fundamental reforms of the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974 in Scotland since it was legislated for and lead to the most progressive reforms of that legislation in the UK. I'm pleased uh, this part of the bill received general support from the Justice Committee right throughout stages one and two. I accept that legislation is of course important, but clearly cultural change is important too. That's why we've made a commitment to help to try and bring about a cultural change in this area. We're going to work with employers to help change the perceptions of people with convictions. People with convictions do have much potential. Part two will be an aid to tackling inequality. It will help prevent those that are already marginalised in our society becoming more marginalised due to lack of employment opportunities, which may result in them remaining involved in the criminal justice system. All the evidence and all the research in this area has shown that stigma can have a real impact on employment and a lack of employment can have a real impact in terms of continuing to re-offend. Therefore, as I often say in these debates, presenting officer, this is not about hard or soft justice, but about smart justice. And as a result, we believe these reforms will also help reduce re-offending. Finally, in part three of the bill, it uh, deals with matters relating to the parole board for Scotland and its activities. The provisions in the bill make some minor technical amendments to existing legislation, make some changes to the appointments and reappointments arrangements for parole board, reinforce the continued independence of the Pro Board and uh, importantly provide for the administrative and accountability arrangements for the Pro Board to be set out uh, in secondary uh, legislation. There's some, these are some initial reforms and improvement but as I've already said in previous debates, uh, the consultation on parole has closed. We'll analyse the results and we'll take forward further changes uh, on parole. So in conclusion, the bill takes forward a number of important changes to improve criminal justice uh, system, the criminal justice system in Scotland. It positions as well as a country looking to the future, not just in terms of how we embrace new technological developments, but most importantly in how we configure a justice system that is both progressive and one that is based on evidence of what is effective in reducing reoffending, while importantly and crucially keeping people safe. I therefore move the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill be passed in my name. Liam Kerr, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to speak for the Scottish Conservatives on the Management of Offenders Bill. The Bill has rightly commanded a lot of time, both in committee and in this chamber, but arguably not enough, because I fear there is a considerable chance that it will put the public at increased risk and deny justice to the victims of crime. And it's because of those implications that I reiterate my concern from stage one, that we have dealt with three possible considerable issues at once. Yes, Mr Finney. John Finney. For the member taking intervention, do the member think it's entirely responsible to say that this piece of legislation will put the public at increased risk? Liam Kerr. It's entirely responsible, Mr Finney, to say what the truth of the matter is, which is, as I shall go on to say, I think this bill could put the public at increased risk uh, because of some of the amendments that haven't been put through today, as we will find out. Presiding officer, the point I was just making is that we've rolled three issues into one. Part three of this bill makes small reforms to the parole board, the detail of which the Cabinet Secretary covered. But it hasn't had the attention or the coverage, uh, the scrutiny, if you like, of part one. And it doesn't deal with the Michelle's Law campaign. Uh, explicit victim and family welfare assessments, more use of exclusion zones, allowing victims and families to attend and speak at hearings, etc. Presiding officer, I'm concerned we've missed an opportunity to take a step back, review the whole parole board and its operation and bring forward a bill directly related to this area. And I make the same point about part two of the bill. Again, the Cabinet Secretary has outlined to Parliament the principles dealt with. We know, we agree that getting a job 
is one of the best routes out of offending behaviour. And striking the appropriate balance between societies and an employer's right to know about prior convictions with the ability of a person with convictions to move on is a difficult one. We support these reforms, but I really do believe that they should have commanded standalone scrutiny. But part one is the most substantive section. It will see an increase in criminals on tags in the community. Now, in the stage one de debate, I stated very clearly that we would have to see improvements to risk assessments and the response to breaches at stages two and three, but we have not. Now, of course, we are happy to support improvements to the technology of electronic monitoring, but I remain concerned that this bill will extend its scope to ever more serious criminals at the expense of public safety. Um, whatever, if it's very brief, please, Mr Johnson. Daniel Johnson. I thank the member for giving me. Could you just substantiate that point? Because in and of itself, I don't understand why this bill will increase the number out on TAG. Other provisions the government bring forward might do, but this one simply changes the technology, does it not? Liam Kerr. Well, no, I don't think it does just simply change the technology. I think the implication of what's being put forward here will put more people out on the TAG. Uh, so I stand by that uh, assertion because... Whatever the Cabinet Secretary's assurances, the key public safety test has not been met. The Cabinet Secretary has rightly reminded us of the reasons why the original bill was postponed and further evidence taken. Uh, and he talks about the shocking, unprovoked and devastating murder of Craig McClelland. Now, although there has been limited improvement to home detention curfew, and I'm glad the Cabinet Secretary acknowledges Roos Davidson's pressure uh, in bringing that forward, the reality is that that tragedy could have happened on any other type of early release and my amendments tried to address this. I tried to mandate a risk assessment tool right through this process. The Justice Committee demanded it after all because surely before we do anything that increases the numbers on electronic monitoring we need to have a robust and trusted assessment tool but the SNP voted it down and the record will show the Cabinet Secretary said it is not needed and I shall leave it to others to make the case otherwise. I also argued that cutting off a tag should automatically constitute a criminal offence. I find it utterly incomprehensible that the bill allows some offenders to cut off their tag and face no criminal sanction. The unlawfully at large offence isn't, offense isn't good enough. It will not apply to those on community sentences who cut off their tags and it will result in delays as the authorities establish whether an offender is unlawfully at large. The SNP removed the power of arrest on suspicion that I put in and it lowered the minimum period someone spends in jail before early release. They also decided it wasn't appropriate to demand better completion rates on community orders. Again, I struggle to understand this. I acknowledge there are reasons why completion rates are what they are, but surely, before you put more people into that system, you try and improve it to avoid the risk that the system becomes overloaded with consequences for the offender and for public safety. President officer, the record will show I did what I could, and I shall take no pleasure whatsoever from being proved correct in the future. On which note, I come back to a point I've made throughout this process. No matter to whom or which agency I pose the question, what is most important in considering release on a tag, public protection, punishment or rehabilitation, no one would clearly say public protection is paramount. The ethos of this bill is something other than public protection. I think it's about keeping people out of the expensive prison system. I think it's not about not offending criminals by calling them relevant persons. I think it is less about reconviction rates and more about saving money. And I think that those considerations figure more prominently than considerations of public safety and justice to victims. Presiding officer, I fear that this bill was proposed by the Cabinet Secretary's predecessor in an atmosphere of complacency and with a view to extending tagging into inappropriate cases. And I fear that this bill has failed to learn the lessons of tragic cases like that of Craig McClelland. For these reasons, presiding officer, my fears for the consequences mean the Scottish Conservatives cannot vote in favour of this bill today. Thank you. Mary Fee, five minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. In opening for Scottish Labour tonight, can I once again thank the clerks and the members of the Justice Committee for their very thorough scrutiny of the management of Offenders Scotland Bill. This bill will strengthen the safety and security of communities across Scotland and it will assist in keeping people out of prison. And during the stage one debate when discussing electronic monitoring, I referred to the view from Families Outside, which said, without structured supports in place, 
electronic monitoring becomes a purely punitive measure. And whilst I do welcome the reforms to electronic monitoring, not a single penny of additional funding is being made available to address the underlying causes of criminal behaviour. And without that, presiding officer, we are setting up people to fail on their release from prison. And for the reforms to be truly successful, they must be backed by substantial budgets in community justice, in social work, and in wider services that tackle poverty, health inequalities, and promote education. I see the Cabinet Secretary desperate to get in. Hamza Youssef. I uh, thank Mary Fee for, for, for giving way, and I just want to give a reassurance that I uh, hope she'll recognise that the criminal justice social work budget is being ring-fenced and protected to the tune of 100 million. Plus, additional funding has been provided for community attendance. I don't take away from her point uh, that we should always continue to look to see uh, how, how we can increase that provision. But does she recognise that at least those two elements, criminal justice social work provision, has been ring-fenced, and also there has been an increase in the budget uh, of the latest spending review uh, to community alternatives? Mary Fee. I, I, I do recognise the points that the Cabinet Secretary has made, but, but I think if we are to be truly successful in rehabilitating um, individuals and keeping them out of prison, we need to fully resource and support not just them, but also their families, and it's crucial that budgets are put in place to do that. Individuals who are released from home detention curfew are often some of the most vulnerable people in society, and it is our duty to provide that support, um, which protects people with convictions, but also um, supports victims and the wider community. And our, criminal, our current justice system frequently sets people up to fail. And we do need the support and services that people need on release from prison. And these do include access to GPs, to housing support, and to a correspondence address. And the third sector has played a vital part in supporting people through the criminal justice system. And they too need guarantees of funding to ensure that support remains in place to assist people away from a life of crime and a life of inequality. And sadly, those guarantees can be limited. Electronic monitoring can support the rehabilitation and the reintegration of people with convictions back into their community. But to ensure this, those on release through electronic monitoring and home detention must know what conditions are being placed on them. And I do welcome the expansion of electronic monitoring. However, the risk assessment processes relating to this must be strengthened. And the multi-agency approach, as recommended by HMICS, must be put in place. And many people in the chamber today have spoken about the tragic death of Craig McClelland. And it does serve as a reminder to us that public protection must be paramount. And Craig's family are also campaigning for authorities to learn further answers, uh, further lessons from this tragedy. And we do support their call that every murder committed by someone on a home detention curfew should lead to a fatal accident inquiry. And I am grateful for the supportive comments from colleagues in the chamber today for Neil Bibby's amendment. Though I am, as the family will be, saddened that this amendment has um, fallen. I also welcome the new offence created at stage two in relation to those who breach their licence conditions. The new offence of being unlawfully at large must be robust with the right support and powers made available to police and prison services to prevent further deaths like that of Craig McClelland. And, presiding officer, before I finish, I want to discuss the provisions in the bill relating to disclosure of spent convictions. There can be no guarantees that people who have served a prison sentence will not face any stigma. However, we must act to ensure that any stigma does not prevent someone from living a full and meaningful life, working to provide for them and their families. And we know that disclosure is complex and rightly required to protect vulnerable groups. And we do support the reforms to disclosure that will encourage people with convictions to feel welcome in society and in the workplace. The Scottish Government must raise awareness with the public, in particular with employers and businesses, to prevent stigma limiting the opportunities to work for those with spent convictions. And, presiding officer, let me finish by repeating the quote from Families Outside, which stated that without structured supports in place, electronic monitoring purely becomes a purely punitive measure. And for the measures in this bill to be successful, we must provide the, appro the appropriate level of care and aftercare for people with convictions. This will benefit society 
as a whole, and I will be happy to vote in favour of this piece of legislation at decision time tonight. Thank you. John Finney, four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, this is good legislation, and it's all the better for having been scrutinised in detail. I'm therefore a bit surprised to hear my colleague Liam Kerr suggest that there was anything other than thorough that scrutiny. I don't recall any aspect where we said we, we didn't look into, and indeed we deferred to take additional evidence. So that's disappointing to hear. The case for reform for this legislation was strongly made, um, and there was consultations in 2013 and 2017, and it is progressive legislation, and I don't think we should apologise for it, or where it sits in the criminal justice landscape in relation to other provisions that have been talked about, including disclosure and the um, presumption against short sentences. Scotland has a, a shameful number of people in its prisons, and we need to empty uh, these prisons, and we need to close some of these prisons, we need to ensure that public safety is paramount and electronic monitoring uh, can play a, a part in that. Um, now, the, 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 the previous uh, the regime in, uh, that was referred to um, as a result of these consultations showed that, that there, it was viewed as a high standard, although there was regional variation. And of course, when we talk about technology and some of the restraints of technology, what we want is a uniform system applying across our country with all its challenges to make sure that everyone has access to all programmes. Uh, and, and, and of course, um, punishment is a role, but it's also about the, the role that the electronic monitoring can play in supporting rehabilitative purposes. If I quote from the, the SPICE briefing, which mentions the, <coughs> the working group report, and it said, it's a versified form of control which can be imposed either as a punishment or to support rehabilitative purposes. The use of electronic monitoring as a standalone punishment should remain a legitimate sentencing op option. However, its various forms, EM, should now be integrated with measures with a proven track record of preventing and reducing further offending, which assist individuals to desist from crime. I think there's a, a lot of opportunities uh, going ahead. There's a lot of opportunities with organisations working together, not simply the statutory organisations, but the vital role that the third sector plays in many of, of these uh, honourable uh, groups have been already mentioned. Um, Restriction of liberty orders, drug treatment testing orders, community payback orders, sexual offence prevention orders are all, all have a role to play in this system too. Now, uh, one of the, the suggestions of transdermal monitoring, I think, is interesting. I'm sure we want to future-proof uh, our, our, our legislation to ensure that the technology comes on board. But at the end of the day, I hope, I hope we never lose fact that it's actually humans we're talking about. Humans with housing needs that have been touched on, humans with medical needs, and that their humanity comes into the system rather than it be a totally automated system because it's the individual and their, uh, their individual circumstances we, we must have. I, I think the role that, that can play pre-trial and in lieu of remand, I think, is, is something that can't be uh, underestimated. Um, and the role it can play, for instance, pre-release in allowing uh, prisoners to go out for housing um, um, and for GPs, things like that. Um, in all of that, the pivotal role of the criminal justice social work um, is absolutely uh, uh, paramount. Now, some of the licensing conditions about location, alcohol and drugs, I think are commendable and, and the, the concerns certainly of uh, <coughs> women's aid part have been addressed by the, 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 the way this legislation has been um, brought forward. Coordination of the public services, we've repeatedly heard, uh, is important. We have the police, we have the prison, we have the courts, we have the social work. I have to say, in the brief time, out of step with that is the role of a private company, and I would have liked to have seen, and Scottish Games would have liked to have seen that taken in-house. In uh, so where are next new technologies? Um, the direction of travel um, um, is um, more progressive. And we must reduce the, the number of people in prison. We must, of course, see to that by diversion from prosecutions and lots of other things. Uh, this is very positive, and Scottish Greens will be voting for it at decision time. Thank you, President Officer. Liam MacArthur, four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I start by thanking uh, those who gave evidence to the committee, to uh, our clerks, Spice, uh, and others. Can I thank uh, my Justice Committee colleagues as well for the collaborative work that's gone into the scrutiny of this bill. Uh, and, and, and so it's all the more disappointing to hear the remarks from Liam Kerr earlier, which I think amounted to, to dog whistle scaremongering. And I think the inconvenient truth is that all the evidence suggests that short-term prison sentences are more disruptive and actually make communities less uh, safe. So we will be supporting 
the legislation this evening. I think Mary, uh, Mary Fee made an entirely valid point about the way in which this is implemented will be crucial, in particular, as we heard time and again, uh, use of electronic monitoring for those who would have been released in any case would not uh, be acceptable in the up-tariffing, but they need to be properly re uh, resourced. Um, similar, similarly, electronic uh, monitoring as an alternative uh, to Gusty, holding those uh, on remand, uh, resourcing again will be key in of itself. Electronic monitoring is insufficient to address issues of public confidence, but it is also the case that without other supports around the individual concerned, it simply risks uh, setting them up to fail. As families outside observed, without structured supports in place, electronic monitoring becomes a purely punitive measure that fails to address the reasons for the offending or to reduce the likelihood of breach due to pressures of unstable housing, substance misuse, poverty, cha chaotic environments and damaging re uh, relationships, as Mary Fee suggested. This must be about improving the chances of rehabilitation and reintegration of individuals within their communities while offering assurances to those communities. In many respects, uh, that will be the measure of whether or not this legislation is successful, as we hope it will be. And it hinges, of course, on assessments and judgments of risk. As I said in the stage one debate, for those assessments to be robust, information and expertise has to be appropriately gathered and shared. Criminal justice social workers must have access to the information they need in compiling their reports, while seeking views from everyone who may be affected, including family members, will be important in assessing the suitability of an individual for electronic monitoring. And where electronic monitoring does not work, despite best efforts and best judgments, we must be prepared to act. And I welcome, therefore, the decision to create a separate offence of remaining unlawfully at large. This was obviously given added weight by the findings of the two inspectorate reports last autumn and is a sensible move towards giving the public reassurance while also taking steps to make our criminal justice system more progressive. Of course, this does little to address the loss and anguish felt by the family of Craig McClellan, uh, who was so brutally and senselessly murdered in 2017. Despite those two inspectorate reports, the family is still waiting for answers as to what happened and how others can be spared the agony they continue to suffer. Uh, with an appeal pending that ang agony uh, deepens. I was disappointed, therefore, that we did not pass Neil Bevy's uh, amendment and Liam Kerr's uh, amendment to that that would have made a fatal accident inquiry automatic in such circumstances. I've said before, the current delays in FAIs are unacceptable. The impact on families who've lost lo loved ones is unimaginable, but it also prevents lessons being learned and, where necessary, laws being changed, and that cannot be right. The changes in rules governing the disclosure of convictions, bringing them more in line uh, south of the border, make sense. And I think we also now need to see employers drop the simplistic and generally irrelevant tick box approach to asking potential employees about convictions. We know that people can and do stop offending and that employment is often a key factor in that persistence. In the interests of public safety, therefore, reducing the barriers to employment, again, makes sense. Deputy Presiding Officer, Passing legislation is inevitably the easy part. Making the changes a success will take effort, collaboration and resources. While Scottish Liberal Democrats will support the bill at decision time this evening, we continue to hold government to account in ensuring that ministers will will the means as well as willing the ends. Thank you. Now move to the open debate and speeches of four minutes, please. I have a little bit of time in hand for interventions if members wish to take them. And I have Rona Mackay, followed by Maurice Corey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, as Deputy Convener of the Justice Committee, can I thank all the clerks for their hard work in helping us get to get the bill to this stage. As always, they've done an excellent job. And can I also thank all our expert witnesses who gave evidence with clarity and professionalism. Uh, Presiding Officer, this is a very important bill, complex in parts, as, as we've heard, but it will pave the way for how we assist a culture change in penal reform in Scotland. It's essential that we get it right, and I believe the amendments made at stage two have been beneficial in achieving that. The three parts of the bill are the expansion and streamlining of the uses of electronic monitoring, a review of the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974, which will change the rules relating to disclosure of convictions, and a review and clarification of the role of the parole board. It brings about a number of reforms which I believe are badly needed to ensure that Scotland's justice system retains its focus on prevention and rehabilitation, whilst enhancing support for victims. 
With electronic monitoring, we know that the key feature in, in this measure is risk assessment, which is why we believe it should only be used after a comprehensive assessment is made, taking everything into account when it comes to public safety. And this is why Amendment 127 is so important. When it comes to compliance, we, we shouldn't forget, as the Law Society briefing reminds us, that many of those subject to electronic monitoring will be amongst the most vulnerable in society whose chaotic lifestyles prevent compliance with provisions of such monitoring. It's therefore essential that the full remit of electronic monitoring is understood by those for whom this is an option and the consequences of non-compliance are made clear to them. In addition, the public must have confidence that their safety will not be compromised by this disposal and all efforts should be made to highlight and re the reasoning for this measure in terms of reduce reducing reoffending and securing rehabilitation. Presiding officer, the committee have highlighted the requirement for adequate budgets to be put in place for criminal social workers and services to support people who may be subject to such monitoring. Funding of such services, many performed by excellent third sector agencies, is crucial to the success of any extended role in electronic monitoring and the Scottish Government's commitment to rehabilitation of offenders. I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's comments and, and, and reassurance in response um, to Mary Fee. A vital aspect is, of course, to keep people out of prison wherever possible. We know the damage imprisonment does to women, families and, in particular, children. Nancy Lauks of Families Outside says, electronic monitoring offers a valuable tool for reducing the use of imprisonment. Prison fractures families, whereas the right support in, with the right support in place, electronic monitoring can keep families together, thereby maintaining social supports and reducing the risk of further offending. We also know that short sentences don't work, which is why the government's presumption against short sentences policy is crucial. This is an important part of the reform jigsaw. The Scottish Government has also taken steps to bolster the law, creating a new offence of being unlawfully at large, which gives police more powers to apprehend prisoners who are escaping justice. The parole reforms aims to simplify and modernise process while placing the... Yes. Liam Kerr. I'm very grateful. Does the member not acknowledge that the unlawfully at large defence is actually quite restricted insofar as it only applies to certain categories? Rona Mackay. Well, it certainly applies to the most serious categories, um, which, is, which is what we're trying to address. And uh, I, I'm, not, I'm, not sure, I'm not actually sure the, what that intervention was meant to achieve. Um, the parole reforms, uh, the bill expressly states that parole board will continue to act as an independent tribunal using professional expertise to ensure the safety of the public. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that Scotland's justice system remains, retains its focus on prevention and rehabilitation while enhancing support for victims. I believe the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill puts these priorities in place and provides the roadmap to a fairer, safer justice system for the people of Scotland. Thank you. Maurice Corey, followed by James Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I too thank the clerks of the committee for their hard work and for the witnesses' evidence given to the committee as well. Uh, people in Scotland need to have the utmost confidence in their justice system. Our sentencing must be both credible and reliable. However, replacing more sent prison sentences with community sentences will not lead to the desired outcome we all want, especially for victims of crime. Without adequate risk assessments or enabling a swift response to breaches of electronic monitoring, this public confidence is dangerously taken for granted. The Management of Offenders Bill seeks to promote an expansion to community sentencing as well as reforms to parole and the disclosure of convictions. These reforms may be positive steps forward in the right direction. However, it is the expansion of electronic monitoring in relation to community sentences that stops this bill short from being truly effective. Of course, we have to strike the right balance, securing community safety while honouring the rights for offenders to be rehabilitated, but we are all surely agreed that when it concerns serious crime, the safety of our communities is paramount. Justice calls for that, and therefore, does it really serve our local areas to expand on community sentencing? Expand on this, and we are widening the risk of reoffence. and offenders justly deserve a punishment that fits their crime. Yes, I will give me. Hamza Yousaf. I really, and I don't say this lightly, but I, I find this contribution derisory, frankly. Uh, would the member not accept that all the research points to the fact that community alternatives are much more effective in reducing reoffending? And if that is the case, does that not mean less victims of crime? And what he's doing is completely counterproductive to victims. I thank Maurice the Cabinet Secretary. 
presiding officer, I thank the cabinet secretary, but then we look, look at it. At the moment, only one in three are, are never completed. Okay, the sentences. All right. Well, s some do, obviously, not the exact figures. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, it's not a private conversation. Are you willing to have another intervention, Mr. Corey? Uh, yeah. Excuse me. Hamza Yusuf. I thank Morris Corey for taking another intervention, but by that logic, does he not understand more people go back to prison uh, in terms of after, after a short prison sentence than for those that uh, end up failing a community uh, payback order? So by his logic, short prison sentences should be abolished, and therefore he should vote for that tomorrow. Morris Corey. No, I don't agree with the, the, the Cabinet Secretary on that, because there are two different types of prison, uh, prisoners, as we say. Uh, there are those who are very difficult to, 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 shall we say, rehabilitate, and those actually, it's happened once, and they are seeing the light, shall we say, all right? So I can see that. And I've seen that in my visits to several prisons in Scotland, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, where people are trying to rehabilitate, we, even within prison at the moment, but uh, obviously we need to be very careful that we don't have one size fits all, and that's the point I'm making. Presiding officer, may I carry on? Uh, but what this bill proposes, which we'll see, is an increase in the use of fines and community sentences and does not go far enough to ensure public safety. I will not deny that this bill puts forward some worthy proposals. For instance, part two of the bill, which focuses on the disclosure of convictions, is certainly a step in the right direction. It aims to reduce the length of time people must disclose convictions after serving their time. And currently, so, so, uh, sentences must be disclosed when applying for new work or further education under the timetable set by the 1974 Disclosure Act. Of course, disclosing these spent sentences for a long period can negatively hamper opportunities to move on from, par from past offences. And for reformed offenders, this change would allow them to move forward. It would encourage them to reintegrate and to contribute to society. And I do not question this part of the bill. However, I do question the purpose of this bill to hand out more community sentences that may ultimately fail to be impactful. For example, we know that a third, as I said earlier on, of community sentences are not completed. And indeed, the completion rate of community payback orders has remained virtually unchanged for the last three years. With this in mind, I am not convinced that this bill will enable a just outcome. And of course, it is right to explore alternatives to prison. A blanket prison punishment for every person and every crime would not be right. But these alternatives are only effective when they are appropriate and allow proper justice for victims. Perhaps it would be more worthwhile to focus on improving electronic monitoring and making it as effective as it can be. For instance, police officers should be given greater powers to respond more quickly to breaches of electronic monitoring. And moreover, if risk assessments were permitted to include greater victim inf information for justice social workers, this would allow for more insightful and appropriate decisions to be made on a firm basis. And I refer to my comment to the Cabinet Secretary in relation to different uh, types of prisoners that we have. And for me, uh, the main concern is this, in this, in this, is this bill's lack of uniform response to removing an electronic tag. And indeed, an offender can cut off or tamper with an electronic tag, yet this bill fails to make it an automatic criminal offence to do so. And this can have catastrophic results, which, as we saw, which has already been mentioned, with the murder of Craig McClellan by James Wright. Also, cases such as this have been rightly informed have rightly informed amendments to this bill. This example has also confronted us with the risk in encouraging um, community sentencing, ex sentencing expansion. And I recognize that breaching sexual offense or sexual harm prevention orders is rightfully seen as an offense. Yet a breach of other types of orders, including drug treatment and testing, restriction of liberty or um, community payback orders, uh, still do not mount to an offence. And surely, every community order and licence conditions to stipulate that removing a tag is an immediate criminal offence. As Victim Support Scotland has highlighted, and has already been highlighted by my colleague <laughs> Liam Kerr, to keep victims safe, we must respond strongly and clearly close, please, to Mr. any Corey. breaches of electronic monitoring. This is the only way to be truly effective for our communities and for our victims. And to conclude, presiding, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, as I said in this chamber before, this bill seeks to reform offenders. But in doing so, it overlooks the needs of victims. These victims des deserve a fair and just outcome, one that places the community safety at the very forefront in their daily lives. James Kelly, followed by Jenny Gilruth. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, as an on-member of the Justice Committee, can I just start by paying tribute to the committee for their due consideration uh, of the bill. I'm well aware of how much work uh, has gone into it, and you can tell by how members uh, are speaking today how seriously they've taken that job. Uh, I think there are two 
uh, main strands to, to the bill before us today. It's the consideration of public safety uh, in relation to uh, the, the people being released on tags and the associated electronic monitoring and also the important issue of re rehabilitation. Um, I think in terms of public safety, it's important that the public have confidence and they can have confidence in relation to some of the elements of part one of the bill, uh, which discusses the extension of electronic monitoring. Um, I think there's been uh, you know, some big steps forward in technology in recent years, particularly in relation to GPS. And that allows uh, those that have been released under electronic tag to be properly monitored to ensure that their, their, their tag remains in place and that they, 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 the chances of them breaching that are minimised. I think it's also important that there is proper multi-agency work uh, to back this up. And I think in regards to that, there are some budget issues that do need to be addressed. I think third sector organisations need proper budget support, as do the, the funding of uh, electronic monitoring. I think it is disappointing that the amendments in the name of Neil Bibby weren't passed in relation to the tragic case of Craig McLeod. I want to pay tribute to Neil Bibby for the way he brought forward those, uh, those amendments, not only today, but throughout the process uh, of the bill. It seems to me, looking at it uh, logically, uh, if someone commits uh, a murder in the prison system or the care system, and there's therefore a fatal accident inquiry, it would seem to me logical that someone who's on a, an electronic tag and commits a murder, there should also be a fatal accident inquiry. Uh, and I think that that would have been better been placed on the, the face uh, of the bill. I think there are key issues as Mary Fee and John Finney have spoken about in relation to rehabilitation uh, in order to reduce reoffending and re you know reduce the, the pressure on, on prisons. Sadly, too many prisoners when they leave prison they are released out onto the street and they don't have they don't have adequate support. Um, groups like the WISE group, you know, carry out a lot of really important work. Um, and I think that's what we should be doing more to support. As other speakers have said, um, for people to uh, go back out into the community, they need a bit of stability in their life. So they need support around housing, not be put in a situation where they might be homeless. They need access to a GP to deal with health issues and support to try and get into employment. All those three factors would give uh, important stability, which would hopefully help uh, those not get into a situation of reoffending and returning to prison. Um, I think the, the issues, just briefly, the issues around the parole board are important. Um, as we go forward, it's important that there's a, a sufficient level of expertise in the parole board, the, the measures in the bill partly address that, and I know there are other issues to consider uh, going forward. Um, and summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, Scottish Labour will obviously support the bill uh, in the vote here at stage three, but I think it's important that there's, a, there's proper follow-through work in terms of funding or multi-agency work and supporting key activity around stability for pr prisoners to reduce reoffending to make the objectives of this bill a success. And the last of the open debate contributions is from Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd also like to thank the Justice Committee clerks, um, our witnesses and my fellow MSPs um, for all their work in helping to get us to stage three today. This legislation is, of course, part of a bigger jigsaw in terms of Scotland's justice reforms. And as section four of the policy memorandum makes clear, the Management of Offender Scotland Bill brings forward a number of reforms designed to deliver on the Scottish Government's commitment to continue to transform the way in which Scotland deals with offenders. That is a careful balancing act for any government between protecting victims and ensuring the need for the justice system to focus on rehabilitation and prevention. 
One of the key measures in this legislation, as we've heard, is the introduction of GPS technology to improve the use of electronic monitoring. And as Section 6 of the policy memorandum states, the expansion of electronic monitoring supports the broader community justice policies of preventing and reducing re-offending by increasing the options available to manage and monitor offenders in the community and to further protect public safety. Um, as Scottish Women's Aid told the committee, electronic monitoring and particularly the use of GPS technologies may help to ensure that perpetrators of domestic abuse serving sentences in the community released on bail or on home detention curfew adhere to the terms and restrictions imposed, thereby improving protection of women, children and young people who have experienced domestic abuse. Nonetheless, Scottish Women said we're keen to highlight that GPS does not detect all forms of domestic abuse and was legislated for by this Parliament just last year. That can include manipulation by text message, for example, or social media communication. Electronic monitoring is therefore clearly not for all offenders and the National Strategy for Community Justice makes clear that alternatives to prison will not be appropriate for some people. Part two of today's... Yes, I will. Liam Kerr. Uh, as you think the member is making important points, said she also agree with um, Scottish Women's Aid that actually we need much harder sanctions uh, if someone cuts off their tag uh, to make sure that those exact scenarios she's outlined uh, can hopefully be pre prevented. Jenny Goldruth. I thank Liam Kerr for that intervention. Um, we've heard from Liam Kerr similar points being made um, throughout today's amendments. Um, I'm not necessarily sure I was convinced on, on either point. Scottish Women's Aid also made points with regard to um, the fear that women might see, for example, if the offender was out on a tag and they were able to see the offender moving around. It could actually increase their anxiety. There are a number of different things that we've taken into consideration throughout the deliberations on the committee that, you know, we're now at stage three. We have considered. So um, I'd like to, to now move on and make a wee bit of progress. But I take his point. Part two of today's legislation considers a fundamental reform of the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974 and its focus is on ensuring that there's a balance between the rights of people uh, not to disclose previous offending behaviour and the need for general public protection. And as NACRO told the Justice Committee in their written submission, criminal record disclosure is one of the main barriers that people with criminal records face when trying to secure employment. Our experience indicates that this is largely due to employer perceptions and misunderstandings, often based on false assumptions around perceived risk to an organisation's security and harm prevention, as well as a belief that people with criminal records lack personal attributes such as honesty and reliability. Presiding officer, expanding the use of electronic monitoring where appropriate should also be considered in terms of Scotland's imprisonment rate, as John Finney alluded to in his contribution. And as Sarah Armstrong from the Centre for Crime and Justice Research told the Justice Committee just a couple of weeks ago, if Scotland were a US state, we would be on a par with Texas or Louisiana in terms of how many people we lock up. Dr Armstrong describes Scotland as a paradox of a country so committed to social welfare investment and yet still making such huge use of an, inex uh, an in incredibly expensive resource as prison. Now, Liam Kerr spoke about costs in his contribution and I actually do want to talk about cost here. Dr Hannah Graham has pointed out that the average cost per prisoner place is £35,325 per year. In contrast, the average unit cost of a community payback order is £1,771 and electronic monitoring or tagging as it is known costs just £965 per year, a fraction of the cost of imprisonment for a country with quite shamefully one of the highest prison rates in Western Europe. Notwithstanding, investing in alternatives to prison shouldn't just be about costs, as Liam Kerr implied. We must measure the impact of what dispensations sheriffs had at their disposal. And indeed, as Mr Kerr's colleague David Gock, the UK Justice Secretary, recently said, we need to move to a more imaginative approach to crime and punishment with a focus on rehabilitation in the community. So we must ensure that there are a range of different and robust alternatives to incarceration which allow the justice system to interpret, uh, interrupt rather, the cycle of criminality without consistently relying on prison as a fallback option and presiding officer I notice I'm well over time so I'll conclude there thank you now move to the closing speeches and I do have a little bit of time in hand so Mr Johnson I can allow you up to six minutes if you wish why thank you deputy presiding officer um, this has been something of a marathon and I, I, I'd just like to acknowledge the bill team sitting at the back who I think in particular have had quite a long uh, process, but I think it has been necessary given the circumstances. But can I begin in my concluding remarks talking about the benefits of the bill, because I think the, there are key benefits, and I believe James Kelly in many ways set out those quite importantly. New technology brings with it new possibilities of uh, doing things more effectively 
and indeed providing new possibilities in terms of monitoring individuals. The fact that we can't currently use GPS in in, in, for electronic tagging, I think, speaks to the need for this bill. And likewise, while we took evidence in committee uh, from Karen McCluskey and others about the possibilities of uh, electronic tags which can monitor alcohol levels or other substances in the bloodstream, I think it's clear the benefits that over the, the very old-fashioned radio tags that we're currently used. I think this does, uh, I think, provide for more effective uh, orders um, and I think more uh, effective monitoring of those that we choose to release from prison. But likewise, I think provisions around disclosure, I think, are important. I think we need to ensure that we make it easier for people to reintegrate in society, not harder. Uh, likewise, I think that the modest uh, changes to the parole board are, are welcome by not being overly prescriptive about those who do it. And, and indeed, I truly welcome uh, the addition of the, uh, pub, uh, the, the test that has been included at stage three. I think it's really important that our justice system is transparent. If people don't understand how our justice system works, then how do we expect them to trust it? By having a, an ex explicit and published test or set of tests, I believe that we can ensure that we have the level of transparency we need in parole, because after all, it is an incredibly difficult um, and important decision that we're entrusting them to do. But ultimately, I think as we consider how we vote this evening, we do need to consider the, 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 the circumstances around Craig McClellan's uh, murder. They were tragic, and I think they showed deficiencies in the regime as it uh, stood at the time. I, I also, and I conceded in stage one, I, I think it possibly showed deficiencies in the evidence that the committee took. I'm not sure we asked the questions about what happens when people breach. Are there sufficient powers as they stood? I think um, those were questions which were asked subsequent to those events, and they were the right questions. And indeed, I, I believe that uh, the implementation of a new offence helps uh, 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 put in, uh, in place the robust measures that are required so that when someone breaches, that we can apprehend them. And likewise, the guidance on risk, I think, improves um, matters in terms of the risk assessment that, that simply wasn't robust enough in the words of the, the prison inspector. Um, and, and, and likewise, um, I think that the future risk management work that's been um, promised by the Cabinet Secretary, along with the Risk Management Authority, will indeed enhance that. But that's not to say that it's not without its shortcomings. I regret that we did not pass amendments around fatal accident inquiries. I think the point that Neil Bibby made in particular, this is essentially the same principle but applied to a slightly different context. If it's right that we investigate the failures that have occurred when a death occurs in custody, when a death occurs uh, while someone is uh, uh, released on tag, I think we need to ask the same questions, the questions that can really only be asked in a fatal accident inquiry. Likewise, I believe there remains work to be done around interagency working. The most major deficiencies uh, in regard to Craig McClellan case was the information being passed from, uh, between SPS um, and the police. We need to do an awful lot more work to make sure that simply cannot happen again. The fact that some of the issues raised were down to simple things like the police not communicating what email addresses they were using, I find astonishing. And quite simply, I think we need to bottom out why that happened. And finally, I do think we should have made a, an offence to cut off a tag. This is the means by which we're monitoring people, and for good reason. And I think that simple act of them tampering or removing that, that means of monitoring them is very serious and should automatically allow the police to apprehend them in and of itself. But I would caution my colleagues across the chamber on the Conservative benches. I agree with Liam MacArthur and what he said to Liam Kerr. I think there is a degree of dog, not just a degree, a substantial amount of dog whistle politics going on. Fundamentally, this bill does not increase the scope of community justice provisions. There are no new sentences or disposals created by this bill. Indeed, the arguments that they make this afternoon may well apply to the presumption against short sentences. There's an argument to be had, one that I would disagree with, but an argument to be had. But the place for it is then not here. And by making it here, you are deliberately misconstruing and deliberately misrepresenting the provisions of the bill. And that is dangerously irresponsible. And I would just say that it does fly in the face of both evidence and indeed what their colleagues in the UK Parliament and the UK government are saying themselves. So can I make one simple suggestion to my Conservative colleagues? Can they go take a walk with Rory?
Ultimately, though, I think this is something of a missed opportunity. While the provisions, I think, are useful, I think this bill more properly should have been looking at what happens when we release prisoners from prison. How do we make sure that their reintroduction to society is more successful? What do they need in order for that to happen? I think Mary Fee was absolutely right in her opening remarks. You know, I, I, my amendments at both stage two and stage three around GPs, uh, proof of ID, address, housing, and what I recognize that they may not have been as well developed as they need to be, but these are the things that we need to examine in future legislation. That is the missed opportunity with this bill. The, 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 the possibility of looking more holistically about how we can make sure that people's release from uh, prison is successful. Success judged by the fact that they no longer reoffend. Success judged by the fact that they have meaningful and gainful employment. Success judged by the fact that they are not released into homelessness. So I would say to the cabinet secretary in the future, we need more debates. And I think it's incumbent on the government to make time for the debates to discuss these big issues about what the purpose of the justice system is, the purpose of prison, and how we make sure that people are successful when they're released from prison, not unsuccessful. And that would be my plea in closing this de uh, debate for Labour uh, to the Cabinet Secretary in this debate. Thank you. I now call Margaret Mitchell. Around six minutes, please, Ms Mitchell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thank all the witness who, witnesses who gave evidence, and I thank the Justice Clerks and members for all their hard work on this bill. But I too consider this to be a, an opportunity lost. Um, in that the management of the offender, for very different reasons for, um, from those expressed by ja uh, Daniel Johnson, makes references to offender in the title. And this has meant it's not possible to expand the use of electronic monitoring to include interim disposals such as bail that are made before a person has been convicted on an offence. So tragically, remand prisoners who are the one group of individuals within the criminal justice system who would most need and who should have benefited from the expansion of electronic monitoring cannot be included. If this bill had been about the extension of electronic monitoring to include remand prisoners, it would have had cross-party support and would have been passed unanimously this evening. The Cabinet Secretary may not be prepared to acknowledge this fact today, but the, am the amendments which he tried to lodge at stage two and which had to be ruled inadmissible because this bill is about post-conviction confirm that sadly this is the case. Instead, the bill is in three parts. Part two reduces the length of time people have to disclose convictions after serving them. It also extends the range of sentences that, that can become spent. And as such, this part had the support of the entire committee. Part three makes reforms to the parole board for Scotland and seeks to remove the requirement for the parole board to include a high court judge and a psychiatrist. There was some considerable debate about this provision. In particular, it seems bizarre in the extreme that after the committee had concluded its stage one report, the Scottish Government lodged a wide-ranging consultation on parole. However, it is part one which covers electronic monitor and expand, monitoring and expands and streamlines the use of electronic monitoring, which contains by far the most worrying and contentious provisions in this area where the committee is divided. In particular, the provisions will make it possible to replace some jail sentences. According to the former Cabinet Secretary for Justice, electronic monitoring could be used for individuals who are being considered for a short-term prison sentence. And this could and probably will include those convicted of domestic abuse. Various stage three amendments have therefore sought to address the breach of electronic monitoring obligations. In terms of response times to breaches, Victim Support Scotland said it takes too long for someone to be found in breach. The amendment I lodged at stage two and then again at stage two, three today, calling for an immediate or an as soon as possible response by Police Scotland sought to provide that effective response 
crucially, where deemed necessary. It's disappointing this did not pass today. Robust risk assessments are crucial. Home detention curfews allow prisoners to spend up to a quarter of their sentence in the community winning an electronic tag. The, the curfew condition requires criminals to remain at a particular place for a set period each day. However, James Wright was able to breach his home detention curfew conditions and to stab father of three, Craig McClellan, to death despite being unlawfully at large for almost six months. The Scottish Conservatives, Labour and the Liberal Democrats have all called for an independent inquiry into Craig McClellan's death. And Neil Biddy did so very effectively again today with his amendment. For, be for without this, no one can be totally confident that the solutions proposed will be adequate. And it is regrettable, therefore, that the Scottish Government has refused a full independent inquiry. Finally, presiding officer, the WISE group has stressed, unless the extension of electronic monitoring is sufficiently resourced, then offenders are being set up to fail. In response, the Justice Committee called on the Scottish Government to provide adequate budgets and said that electronic monitoring should only be used after a comprehensive assessment of risk, particularly for those individuals who would otherwise have been incarcerated. Presiding officer, as neither of these conditions have been adequately fulfilled, the Scottish Conservatives will be voting against the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill this evening. I now call on the Cabinet Secretary to conclude the debate. If you could take us up to decision time, please, Mr Yusuf. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I too would like to thank members across the Chamber for their contributions to the debate, at least uh, most of them. And I would like to extend my thanks to all of those that have been a part of scrutinising and shaping the bill during its passage through Parliament. I would also like to thank the Scottish Government's bill team uh, and their wider colleagues in the Scottish Government for all their working in drafting the bill. They have been an excellent bill team that have worked uh, with a couple of cabinet secretaries uh, to get this bill into good shape as it is uh, today. Uh, can I can also uh, put on record my thanks to the Cabinet Secretary, uh, to my pre to our predecessor, uh, Michael Matheson, for all the hard work that he did uh, on this bill uh, at its introductions. Um, can I turn to the contributions that have been made? I wasn't planning to spend much time on the Conservative contributions, but I cannot let their, frankly, naked opportunism uh, go at all. For the Conservatives, for such... Uh, often intelligent people to have made such asinine remarks during their closing speeches, I find derisory and I find incredible. Uh, Liam MacArthur called it dog whistle politics. He is right in that. He called it grandstanding politics. He is right in that. But I have to say the opposition is as predictable as it is, frankly, tiresome. Because we know that it is just playing to their gallery. We know the pattern. I would bet my mortgage on it that there will be a press release from Liam Kerr and the Conservatives tonight or tomorrow littered with the phrase soft justice. This will be picked up by his friends in the Daily Mail, the Daily Express. He will play to his gallery, but not successfully, because the majority of Scots do feel safe. And I say to Liam Kerr and to the Conservatives, but particularly to Liam Kerr, uh, I have a great amount of time uh, for him, but he is losing and is losing credibility quickly on this issue. The research the data demonstrates clearly that progressive justice reforms like the ones we're proposing today and the ones that we will vote on tomorrow are going to reduce reoffending. That means less victims in crime. In fact, whenever progressive reforms are brought to this chamber, Liam Kerr and the Conservatives fail time and time again. They present a false picture, presiding officer, that there is a binary choice to be made between victims versus those that have committed crime. That is simply not the case. It is very possible to be on the side of victims just as we are, just as every member of this chamber is, but also want to improve uh, the chances and rehabilitation chances of those who have committed crimes. It is not a binary choice. I will. 
Liam Kerr. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary. So is it his position that a proper risk assessment tool and sanctions for cutting off a tag is merely dog whistle politics and a binary choice? Hamza Yousaf. I think he has used several policy positions and he has used several hooks to do what he was always going to do when this bill was introduced, which was vote against it. He was always going to vote against this bill because it simply did not play to the gallery that he wishes to play to. And it just does not diminish, it doesn't just diminish the Conservatives to present this false choice between victims versus the rehabilitation of those who commit crimes. It is frankly an insult to all of his colleagues across this chamber who believe that if we improve the chances of rehabilitation for offenders, then we reduce reoffending, and as a result, we have less victims of crime. I mean, just take some of the points that were made. And Maurice Corey said, uh, Maurice Corey said that, of course, uh, he couldn't support the bill because of the rates of CPO completion, and he talked about imprisonment as as, uh, as an alternative. The reconviction rates, in fact, of, of those in short sentences, are nearly twice as high as those who are given a community payback order. That is simply an argument for further community alternatives not to back more punitive short prison sentences. So uh, I am disappointed, but I am not surprised at the dog whistle, as Liam MacArthur called it, dog whistle politics of the Conservatives. Uh, and I would say and make that plea, as Daniel Johnson did to the Conservatives, that perhaps you should take a, a walk with Rory, as he described it. You should speak to your government colleagues uh, down in the UK government, like David Cock, Gawk, somebody I have a lot of time for, uh, many others that have looked towards Scotland uh, and said that there are much that they can learn from our policies in terms of rehabilitation uh, of those who commit crimes. Uh, as for other contributions that have been made uh, across this chamber, uh, can I thank Mary Fee for what I thought was a very thoughtful speech uh, and contribution to. I want to give her those reassurances, uh, the, the, the questions that she asks of the government in terms of uh, uh, further spend on community alternatives. That is, we have stepped up to that challenge in the spending review. What I would say to Mary Fee, if I can throw back a challenge, come the next spending review, uh, it would be helpful if Labour came with proposals to the Cabinet Secretary of Finance to say, yep, this is where we want to see some of that money spent. And let's enter into a productive dialogue in that regard. An excellent speech by, by, by John Finney. I thought Rona Mackay, uh, Jenny uh, Gilruth uh, also. Uh, Daniel Johnson, uh, maybe a special mention. I see he's gone all al fresco since he's uh, left the front bench. His tie is off. Uh, he looks more relaxed. Uh, but as always, regardless of whether he's at the front bench or the back benches, he made a very considered speech. Uh, an excellent speech, actually, uh, and one uh, that, that I think the Conservatives and others outside of here would do well uh, to listen to. Um, and I take his point about the government having to reflect uh, on the fact that we can potentially bring forward further debates around other issues uh, that affect prisoners, for example, support to uh, housing, support to GP services, uh, and indeed other through care uh, support. Uh, so uh, once again, uh, presenting officer, just to, to end on, I'm very proud to be uh, moving uh, this uh, motion in my name, this bill, uh, at stage three. I think it's part of a wider package of progressive justice reforms that we have brought forward as a government. And at the heart of those reforms is that we have the absolute belief that people are capable of change. We believe that those that have committed crimes can transform their lives, can be productive members of society, can contribute back to society, and can change their lives for the better. And this bill is one part of that suite of measures. We will vote tomorrow on the presumption against short sentences of 12 months. It's a suite of measures that we will bring forward that says, yes, we are on the side absolutely of victims, and we will continue to improve their justice journey in the criminal justice system and throughout the criminal justice system. But hand in hand with that goes the belief that people can change and that rehabilitation and the belief in rehabilitation is absolutely paramount. And with that, I'm delighted to move uh, the, the, the motion in my name and commend this bill uh, to the Parliament. Thank you. That concludes our Stage 3 debate on the management of Offenders Scotland Bill. And before we turn to decision time, our next item of business is the election of a member for appointment to the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body. I have received one valid nomination for appointment. The nomination is Rhoda Grant. So I'm going to put the question to the Chamber. The question is that Rhoda Grant be selected for appointment to the Scottish Parliament corporate body and members should press their yes, no or abstain buttons now.
They have voted yes, 108. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions. Uh, so, Rhoda, sorry, Rhoda, Grant. <laughs> Rhoda Grant is duly selected for appointment to the SPCB, and I congratulate Ms Grant on her appointment. <laughs> there is one question to be put as a result of today's business at decision time. The question is that motion 17893, in the name of Hamza Youssef, on the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill be agreed, and members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17893 in the name of Hamza Youssef is yes 82, no 26. There were no abstentions. The motion is agreed and the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> Thank you. That concludes decision time. We're going to move on to members' business shortly in the name of Gil Patterson on health issues raised by aircraft noise. We'll just take a few moments for ministers and members to change seats.